All right, NWA Championship Wrestling from August 9th, 1986. You know, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I feel a little bad for Vince Russo. Vince Russo is a complete numbskull. He's failed at virtually everything. But at least he could always say, I invented Crash TV. Wrong. There was never a Russo show as frenetic as this one-hour television show. (laughs) Have you ever seen more segments crammed into one 55-minute show? There, I swear to God, there had to be 80 segments on this. I'll count while you go through the first one. Well, let me do some... Okay, I'll... I'll, You count that. I'll I'll count something else, but I'll start reviewing this first segment and match. So they show the Andersons at a house show. They jumped the Rock and Roll Express. They attempted to work over Robert Gibson's tape ribs. And as usual, we didn't see much of this before the opening credits and music rolled. And the announcers ran down the show in the studio. They were joined by tonight's guest host, Jim Cornette, who was wearing flamingo sunglasses he claimed to have received from Elton John and held up his tennis racket, which had a custom-made uh, racket sleeve, I guess you call it. It just said Jim in big letters. That made me laugh. He ran down Baby Doll and Dusty Rhodes for a while. Opening match was the Kansas Jayhawks versus Bill Mulkey and Pete Myers. Okay, before we get into this, and I know it'll be quick, by my count, and I may have missed something, there were no less than 22 segments in a 50-minute show, which means approximately every 2.5 minutes there was a new segment. <laughs> that is outrageous it sounds low actually <laughs> i'm sure there's some, more some of these averages there I'm, were there were some segments here that went less than 30 seconds oh yeah all right um anyway kansas jayhawks versus bill mulkey and pete myers the jayhawkers david crockett immediately screwed up the name of the new team called them the jayhawkers and let me tell you something we accidentally watched the first five minutes of next week's show he calls them the jayhawkers again you know the best part about it He's David Crockett, and so Tony Schiavone does not correct him. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to let this dipshit call him the Jayhawkers. Sure thing, Mr. Boss's brother. And so Tony just calls him Jayhawks. Yeah, he does, he, yeah, exactly. Like, I'll keep calling them Jayhawks, and maybe this dumb shit will get the clue. But he never does. So, Bobby Jaggers, I don't think I'd ever seen... I've heard the name a thousand times. I don't think I've ever seen him work until the, this show. Boy, he looks like Buddy Rose. He is a doing his best fat Buddy Rose impersonation. He's Buddy Rose with a beard and a cowboy gimmick. And BJ on his trunks. He does, in fact, say BJ right on his pelvis. <laughs> BJ in white letters right there. They're the baby faces. <laughs> Dr. Mantel is in here as the baby face. Yes. I don't know. Th- threatening to attack a man with a whip. That's right. Too many WWE shows. I was, I was aghast. <laughs> Pete Myers has the worst lockup I think I've ever seen. His bumping and selling were hardly any better. Is it Pete or Pat? I wrote Pete. It's, it's quite possible I screwed that up. Yeah. Uh, Mantel was great, and they won with the elevated clothesline off the, off the ropes. Maybe that's the Jayhawker. Could be. Could be. And the Rock and Rolls came out for a promo. Robert Gibson starts to speak. I know this is this dead horse has been beaten solidly by now, but... Brian, I know you never watched a show called King of the Hill. There's a character on there named Boom Hour. I believe Robert Gibson did that man's voice. Dude, he may as well have been Ahmed Johnson. <laughs> I don't know. I couldn't. I, I, honest to God, if you put a firearm in my head right now, I could not. I swear on a stack of Bibles, I could not tell you one word that came out of his mouth. Yeah, I have a Anderson, arm bar, ribs. That's more than I got. <laughs> <laughs> I got more out of what you just said, because I heard one word, ribs, yeah. than I heard in any of his promo. So, Morton comes in to save the day like he does every single time, and he's talking about how the, the Andersons tried to take him out, but they underestimated how tough the rock and rolls were, and he said, here's what happened next. So, what happened was, the Andersons jumped the rock and rolls in the ring, but Morton chased them off, and then... When the Andersons try to cut a promo, the Rock and Rolls follow them to fight more and chase them off the interview set. We had Shivani interviewing Magnum TA. I was very confused by what happened here, and they did explain it later. The Best of Seven series, they went to have match... Let's see, I guess it was match... 
Match six, yes. They are having Mac match six with Nikita up three to two, but that ended in a double disqualification. So Nikita is still up three to two. Right? I think it was a double count out. Regardless. Regardless, yes. Yeah. It's now it's now three to two. Magnum is trailing Nikita. Yes, and there's gonna be an extra match now. Yes. So Magnum says he's proven that if he can keep Ivan and Crusher Crusoe out of the picture, then he can beat Nikita on his own. He's gonna do it twice more and he's gonna regain regain that US title. Good babyface promo. It's Magnum. Jimmy Valiant versus Tony Zane. Okay. Is Tony Zane's nickname really Hurricane? That's what Jim Cornette called it. Hurricane Tony Zane. I couldn't find it. But when I Googled it, I saw a page describing the Tony Zane-Nikita Koloff rivalry. There's no way that Tony Zane had a rivalry with Nikita Koloff. It had to have just been a series of squash matches. (laughs) I think so. Now, Valiant comes out and he's wearing a do-rag. Because he's a bald-headed geek, and he's unhappy about that. Valiant in 1986 was 44 years old, and he literally was working like Hulk Hogan in his 2004-2005 run. But Valiant, today, is doing all right, all things considered, 30 years later. Physically. So the moral of the story is, it's better to nip it in the bud and work like a 55-year-old man when you're 40. Oh, yeah. Then to kill yourself and then be a physical wreck when you're a 55-year-old man. Yes. So there's more in this story. But what they have done with the bald-headed geek angle and how it has is turned the page into a new chapter. It is genius. But suffice to say, Valiant came out here, worked the entire match in his do-rag, and won with a boogie-woogie elbow. Dick Murdoch comes out for a promo. Since he cannot just sit at home in his Texas ranch. I think we're five minutes into the show right now. <laughs> in the 18th segment here. Something like that, yes. He says he cannot just sit at home in his Texas ranch, not with men like the Horsemen and the Russians and the Minute Express running all crazy. And as he's talking, out comes Baby Doll. <laughs> Baby Doll, who has been described as Dusty Rhodes' as personal, and who also is managing the Warlord, she comes out here and she kisses Dick Murdoch on the cheek. And based on Dick Murdoch's reaction, this had to have been his first kiss. <laughs> he was very excited. She showed up, and she said, there's a show in St. Louis tonight, and I would like to enlist your services. And she kissed him, and he lit up and immediately walked off arm in arm with her. That's right. She is a baby face, <laughs> and her character is that she is a whore. She's a seductress. I'm sorry. Yes. It was not right for me to say that. But yes, uh, Miss Elizabeth, this isn't. No, this is not <laughs> Miss Elizabeth. No, no. Some would call her a whore. Yes. and Certainly not me. Including someone on the show. So really what Brian was doing there was just foreshadowing. That's right. Warlord and Baby Doll versus George South. I was so excited for another opportunity to determine if the Warlord is better or worse than Braun Strowman. And I paid intense attention to this match. It is a fucking tough call. I think that the Warlord is slightly better. They both stand very upright and stiff in the exact same way. They both have a very, very limited number of moves. But I do believe that Braun Strowman has screwed up more of his basic moves in the last month than the number of basic moves that the Warlord has screwed up. So my conclusion is that Braun Strowman is worse than the Warlord in 1986. Thank you. Take that to the bank. I'm. You definitely spent more time talking about the Warlord than he wrestled here. He won with a power slam. My highlight was Jim Cornette on commentary claiming that Big Bubba's physique was better than the Warlord's. That's awesome. Yeah, Cornette called the Warlord the fat guy. <laughs> yes, and Big Bubba was the ripped one. Because he's all muscly. That's right, that's right. So they showed footage of an angle from Kansas City. Central States Wrestling was where the show was held. It's Dusty Rhodes defending the NWA World Championship against Ric Flair in what appeared to be an eight-foot ring. Before the match, they're doing the introductions, and out come Tully Blanchard and J.J. Dillon. And they cut a promo saying that Tully Blanchard here is the national champion. That should make him the number one contender. And he wants to face the winner of this match regardless of who it will be. 
You know, it may have been a legit 12 to 15 foot ring. It was tiny. Because those, those rings, there were some very, like, shockingly small rings. Yeah. So, they cut to the finish. Here's how this match ended. <laughs> Flair charges into the corner. Dusty pops out and clotheslines him. He makes a cover. And Flair's foot was under the ropes, but still. Dusty hits a clothesline. Flair goes down, and the ref counts three. So while it did not count on a technicality, and while Flair did in fact argue that he could have kicked out but chose not to because he had his foot under the ropes, I just saw Ric Flair get pinned clean with a clothesline. <laughs> well, you know. Nutty. I call it a lariat. Sure. An axe bomber. <laughs> this is not an axe bomber. <laughs> Which, Flair was susceptible to that axe bomber. Yeah, I've seen him get axe bombed a million times, millions of times. So Tully then jumps Dusty. He starts working the leg over the chair. Flair locks into figure four, and Tully comes off the top, and eventually the locker room cleans house. This leads into a very confusing show-long storyline. Then Dusty does a promo. And Dusty Rhodes is a fat man cutting this promo in a tight, white, wet t-shirt. This is significantly worse than just being bare-chested. Oh, really? I was going to argue that, but... It's I I pretty sure. So he vowed there would be justice in the horseman. He was going to take care of it himself, and he was going to start hurting people. It was so simple. This man got fucked, and he's not complaining about it. But he's pissed off, and shit's about to go down. He's going to take care of it. No crying. No. No complaining. It's exactly. It, there was nothing here that Vince McMahon would hate. Right. Yet nobody does promos like this. Where you're just really, really mad, and you're going to kill somebody. Because somebody's got to hand you a script that's 17 pages long. Sucks. It totally sucks. I'll tell you what sucks. Bill Tab and Randy Bryant versus the Russians. You know, people always talked about Nikita, and he was a big muscle man, and he was no Ric Flair. He was Ric Flair in this match. Yeah. Fucking Crusher Khrushchev screwed up his very first spot. Which was supposed to be like a lateral drop or something. Mm -hmm. It fucking DT'd the guy right on his head and almost killed him. See, perhaps my eyes are biased. I saw it as Randy Bryant not going, knowing how to go down for an amateur takedown. Well, you know, that could be it as well, yeah. but I've not seen a good Crusher Khrushchev match yet. I haven't either. Or promo. I have no, no. And moments later, here, here's another reason I'm blaming on Bryant. Nikita goes to neck Bryant on the ropes. A very simple move to take. Bryant looked like he had no clue what he was doing, and he nearly lost his head <laughs> taking this move. We did have Bill Tab hitting the ring, who was legit one of the four or five biggest dudes in the company, and they actually gave him the stare down of death with Nikita, and then Nikita just beat the fuck out of him anyway. Eventually, they pinned Tab with the sickle. Paul Jones and his army came out for a promo. Can I say something about this, and I'll let you describe the promo? This was so phenomenal. Because Paul Jones and his army are total fucking geeks, but they're not. Because they just shaved Jimmy Valiant. They have instant credibility. Mm -hmm. In WWE, they have all these idiot groups, 3MB, they used to have the fucking League of Nations, just a bunch of geeks. And the best the geeks can do is beat other geeks. And thus, everybody remains a geek. Nobody took Paul Jones' army seriously. And then they fucking beat and shaved Jimmy Valiant and turned him into a bald-headed geek. And you know what else that accomplished besides giving them credibility? Now when they brag about it, they get more heat than ever. Yes. Because the fans were wrong. <laughs> we thought you guys were geeks, but you shaved Jimmy Valiant. This was fucking amazing. So these guys come out for a promo, and it's pretty much the whole crew. No Baron this week, but it was Paul Jones, it's Shaska Watley, it's the Ball Baron, it's uh, T. Joe Khan. And as Tony's asking him a question, the fans are chanting bald-headed geek, presumably a Shaska. And before answering Tony's question, Jones just says, fans, you can chant bald head of geek all you want. Jimmy Valiant's not coming out here. And they all grab their bellies and howl with laughter. 
It's awesome. Have I ever publicly apologized for disparaging the great number one Paul Jones? Dude, you need to do it every week here on this show. I apologize for ever saying anything bad about number one Paul Jones. He was number one. He was amazing. He says, we shaved Jimmy Valiant bald just like we said we would. And then he comes out here and wrestles in a bandana. Shame. Shame. (laughs) Shame. It is shameful. And now here's the key. Here's the key. He was appalled that Jimmy Valiant would lose this match and get his head shaved and then come out and wrestle in a, ban- in a bandana. He vowed, either I or one of my men, we're going to get a match with Jimmy Valiant and we're going to yank that bandana off. And there you go. Now, even though they've shaved his head, we have more reason to want to see them wrestle again. That's right. We have to see Jimmy defend his bandana. And also, of course, we know Jimmy in his heart wants revenge on them as well. So there's a perfectly good reason for this feud to continue. That's right. How many times have we seen the babyface win on pay-per-view, and then just randomly there's another match? Dude, it's every main event in WWE this year. And there's never any reason to care. Do I need to go back over that Jericho-AJ feud? But the heels vowing that they will rip off that bandana and show the world this bald-headed geek Jimmy Valiant. It's fucking great. And by the way... This may be where Buddy and Richie got the gimmick for the, their bandanas. It could be. And how you knew if you if it was a good worker, they keep the bandana on the whole match. It could be. But in that storyline, it was the heel that got his head shaved. That's true. And he wore the wig. Yes. And so the he the baby face finally pulled the wig off, and his hair had grown back. <laughs> back. And so he thought he'd put one over on them. But the baby faces then announced that they had secret locker room photographs of him bald which they sold and made a killing yes <laughs> fucking this business is not what it used to be no god that was genius so the other key point here is towards the end uh jimmy or uh, paul jones said that he had in fact made a big money offer to rage and bull to recruit him into the army by the way what a basic storyline where the heel thinks he outsmarted the baby faces but they were one step ahead. That's right. <laughs> Can we just go back to this? And meanwhile, Shaska cuts his promo about how he and the ball baron are going to beat us in the hillbillies. Dick Murdoch versus Vernon Deaton. Dick beat him up. One with a brain buster. Anything else? Nope. Okay. Rick Fair comes out for a promo, and here is where I started to get confused on the show. Okay, forget the confusion. Let me just talk about the interview itself. It was another awesome interview. When Ric Flair is the champion, he comes out, and he's got his suit on, and he's got his belt, and he's got his rings, and he don't give a shit about nothing. And he talks about his money, and his cars, and his jets, and his women, and he gives his hotel room number, and he just is out there fucking around. Then he loses the title, and now... He's a new man. He is not only, he is the best wrestler in the world, and he is pissed off that he's not the champion because he cannot be Ric Flair without the world title. Without the world title, he ain't Slick Rick. And so he doesn't come out there and talk about the women and his cars. I mean, he mentions and everything like that. But he has he has got a one track mind back to the world title because then he can be Ric Flair again. By the way, I finally got the word count thing working. Uh, these are both one hour programs: the NWA and Ring of Honor. Is that right? Yep. Ring of Honor. I wrote eight hundred fifty words. Yeah. And I liked it a lot, so I had a lot to say. NWA almost thirteen hundred. That's right. <laughs> it's like fifty percent longer. All right. So in this promo, the key here was. He denied that there was any kind of conspiracy between himself, Tully, Tully Blanchard, and J.J. Dillon to attack Dusty Rhodes in Kansas City. It had been a spur-of-the-moment thing. And later, Tully Blanchard came out and said the same thing. He never meant to attack Dusty Rhodes. And I'm watching thinking, who cares? Why would we care if that was their plan going in? Tully Blanchard deliberately attacked that man's leg with a chair. Ric Flair deliberately put that man in a figure four leg lock, and they both beat him up together until his friends made the save. Who cares whether they thought of that as the match was going on or they planned it that morning? What difference does it make? But it seemed to be vitally important that the forcemen deny any shenanigans. Not that they denied attacking him. 
It is to deny the reason and the time of planning. So he turned, eventually he addresses Dusty. He says, now that Dusty was his champion, he's going to learn how hard life on top is. He doesn't just have to worry. <laughs> that's, that's ironic. He doesn't just have to worry about the figure four. He's got to worry about the sleeper. He's got to worry about the belly to belly. He's got to worry about the nature boy and the road warriors and the Garvins and the horsemen. And on top of that, he says, one night you're at a bar and a pretty little girl comes up, grabs your arm and says, you're not from around here. And between all those challengers and all those women, Dusty's going to wear down and I'll be there to get my belt back. So Ric Flair's plan to regain the world title is to patiently wait while Dusty Rhodes fucks himself out of shape. <laughs> That's what I got. I just thought it was so ironic that to Ric Flair, it's life is much, much harder when you're not the champion. Yes. Life is so much easier for Rick when he's the champion. Yeah, well, that's right. But he's trying to convince Dusty, you really don't want to be the champion. Life is so hard as the champion. Well, it, it, it's so hard, only a great man like Slick Rick can handle it. Well, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Steve Regal was the new junior heavyweight champion. He beat Rocky King in less than a minute with a leg sweep. I was going to say, I left the room for one moment, <laughs> and match. I came back and it was over. <laughs> and all I wanted to know was, is Rocky King the new junior champion? Nope. Okay. <laughs> Cornette interviewed the Russians. They ran down Dick Murdoch and Magnum TA. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Midnight Express is in the ring with two men. Yeah. And I said, Vinny, who are the two geeks? And you said, I'm trying to find out. And so I wrote down Midnight Express versus two geeks. You're still looking around. Cornette then says, David Crockett, who are these two geeks in the ring? David Crockett, speechless. He has no idea. Because David Crockett has no fucking idea who the two geeks are in the ring. Cornet then says, they must be... What was it? Uh, in quotes. Thank you. Get angry at James E. Cornet. Semi-retarded. That's what he said. If they were stupid enough to get in the ring with the Midnight Express. Now, whoever these men were, they were not trained. I'm convinced they won a raffle or something to go wrestle the Midnight Express in a match. You've never seen anyone deadweight a guy like the guy deadweighted the Conor in this body slam. So eventually the Rocket looks or the Midnight Express just hit the rocket launcher and won. When he deadweighted him, the receipt that he received. Oh yeah. <laughs> he just like took his head off. Yes. Yep. And and, and they went right to the finish. Express said, We're done here. <laughs> and they hit the rocket launcher and won. For the record. I wrote down, after the graphics flashed on the screen, I wrote down Perkins and Pillman as the jobber's name. I did the research. I got them both wrong. <laughs> it was Darren Evans and Tom Pittman. Oh, Pittman. So it wasn't Brian Pillman It was here? not Brian Pillman. Okay. Fresh out of Cincinnati Bengals training camp. Dylan and Blanchard came out to do a promo. They also denied any kind of conspiracy. I still was not clear what the point of any of this was. And uh, finally, Tully claimed he had beaten Dusty for the national title so he could beat him for the world title, too. And he attacked him to Kansas City, not because he was upset Dusty had beaten Flair, but because I don't like you. <laughs> you made that clear over and over again. So here's a good analogy for you. You did not watch the main event of that G1 show, which was Tanahashi and Marafuji. A great match. All right. Tully Blanchard was Tanahashi versus Marafuji his whole career. Because he was always there behind Ric Flair, mm -hmm. who was like the greatest promo ever. And so, no matter how great Tully was, he wasn't the best promo. So, Rick was. No matter how good Tanahashi Marafuji was. That's right. They couldn't follow Ishii's match. I see. Tully is so great. I say this every goddamn week. Yeah. I even asked Dave the other day, I said, how is Tully not in the Hall of Fame? He was a great worker. He was a great talker. I'm sure many people can make arguments about why he wasn't in the Hall of Fame. But my God, he was great. Rock and Roll Express versus Pablo Crenshaw and Bob Burroughs. Just when I thought I've seen the dirt worst physical specimen <laughs> Sane. of a jobber. Bob fucking Burroughs. New levels of skinny fatness. Dude, he's skinny fat. He's pale. He was wearing gray trunks. What? Two big gray trunks. Think about this. His gray trunks were hanging loose on his skinny fat frame. We're in the fucking color TV era. <laughs> and he goes to get trunks 
And he's like, can I get him in gray? Gray with his pale white pasty skin. Gray trunks, white knee pads. Not with, silver. With gray. white socks. Yeah, yes. gray, like a fucking cloud. Purple boots. This guy was hideous. What was he thinking? He wasn't thinking this, this that's be, why he was a jobber. It had to be many ribs at once or many lost bets. Rockwell Express pinned him in less than a minute with the uh, double drop kick. So the Andersons come out to jump the rock and rolls, rock and rolls again. Here's what happens. They get the advantage of surprise. They toss Morton out of the ring. They go to attack Gibson's injured ribs again. But as Arn or Ole, it doesn't matter. As one of them is coming off the ropes, Morton catches him coming down with an elbow and he beats up Arn by himself. He sends both of them packing by himself as Robert Gibson is down clutching his ribs in pain. Did Morton get any benefit out of this tag team at all? Did Gibson ever lend a hand? Well, yeah, they were the Rock and Roll Express. He couldn't have just been because the... he didn't make it as a single star. How? Why? <laughs> it's impossible. Little. <sighs> yeah, I've, the, Robert Gibson was the biggest anchor I've ever seen, and Morton dragged him all over the world to amazing heights. So Jimmy Garvin and the newly permed Precious come out for a promo. Do you remember? This is the dated reference to all data references. Precious is a beautiful woman. But when she curled her hair, she went from Rebecca de Mornay all right. to Fabulous Moolah. That's unfortunate. <laughs> it was very unfortunate. <laughs> Whose decision was this? I don't know. <laughs> this was the worst transformation I've ever seen for a perm. <laughs> so... And I do think she's beautiful. But my God, this was a terrible (laughs) fucking perm. Poor, poor choice. Jimmy demands that Dusty come out and defend his title. He says Dusty is a lousy champion who hangs out with a loose woman. That woman comes out here kissing every man she sees, kissing a redneck. And that redneck is using Jimmy Garvin's own brain buster very poorly, I might add. And Jimmy Garvin was great. Randy Barber versus Buddy Landell. (laughs) Oh, my God. Randy Barber gets put in a figure four leg lock. He sells it by getting as straight as a board and not moving until the referee stopped it. He wasn't even like flailing. <laughs> rigor mortis. He literally, he did. He went into rigor mortis in the middle of this fucking figure four. Where do they get these shitheads? <laughs> the jobbers on the show. Jesus Christ. Well, our current jobbers are too too qualified. We must fire them and find shittier men. <laughs> a parade of goofs. Now, afterwards, Buddy Landell and Bill Dundee go over to cut a promo. 80% of which was both of them calling out Ric Flair as a lousy rip-off nature boy who couldn't get the job done. Now the real nature boy is here. Can you imagine if they called up, let's just pick a guy, Ty Dillinger. And he shows up on Raw and all of a sudden, he's got a blonde streak in his hair and starts calling himself the real architect. And the key to this is Seth Rollins never acknowledges his existence. Oh, yeah. That's what this is. He is desperately trying to get under Ric Flair's skin, desperately trying to get Ric Flair to address him, to bring him up to, uh, bring him up to Flair's level. And Flair just ignores him. Doesn't know he's alive. Listen, all I know is I try very hard to listen to Dundee, but his accent is so amazing that I'm just transfixed. It was not as distracting to me as it was last week, although he talked a lot more last week. But yes, it's very strange. And finally, Cornet does a quick promo. He runs down Dusty Roads. He runs down the Rock and Roll Express. He says goodbye and we'll see you next week. Wrapped it up right on cue because he's a total pro. That's right. And that was that. Much, much, much better than last week. It was, although I did not realize just how much had gone on until we started that, and I really until we finished it. <laughs> Twenty, what did I say? Twenty-two segments in one hour, in like fifty-four minutes or something. Yeah, that's the one and only. Woo! I can play the, them all. Entertain the people while I find it. All right. Well, we got this uh, NWA Championship Wrestling show, and the highlight of which I did write that down. During the opening match, uh, David Crockett called the Kansas Jayhawks the Jayhawkers, as he does every single time. And I don't know at this point if it's his nickname for them or if he's just that bad at his job. All right, I've been told you're either going to love this or you're going to hate it. You, specifically. Me, me. 
It's very high. Yeah. All right. How can you hate this? This is outstanding. Did you add that? No, I oh, about that, yes. Okay. Yeah. That was awesome. I believe I let the beat drop. That should be your theme when yes. you come back to wrestling. <laughs> it should, actually. <laughs> you could dance out the to that. techno ballad of an EV. Hey. All right. NWA World Championship. Another hour-long show for some reason. I think 90 minutes. No. It was one hour and five minutes long. I meant, okay. When it originally aired, 90 minutes with commercials. Mm. August 16th, 1986. The announcers opened the show, let us know that Ric Flair had defeated Dusty Rhodes in St. Louis to regain the world championship. They said the best of seven series between Nikita and Magnum is now tied at 3-3. It's still not over. This is the longest goddamn best of seven series ever. This feud may have been longer than the actual Cold War. The seven days that it took the Lord to create the Earth was shorter than the seven fucking days it's taken to finish this feud. Yes. Jim Cornette was there to co-host the show, and he cut a promo on Dusty while he was there. Kansas Jayhawks versus George South and Bill Mulkey. Yes. My favorite spot. They come out, and immediately, David Crockett calls them the Kansas Jayhawkers. And the moment the words come out of his mouth, Tony Schiavone, of course, calls them the Kansas Jayhawks. Because he's hoping one of these days, he'll say it, and David Crockett will get the hint. Yeah. It's been weeks now. What I love is the Cornets on commentary, and he starts talking about what great elbows the Jayhawks threw. They both made great use of elbow strikes and elbow smashes, and Bobby Jagger's elbows were very good, but Dutch Mantel's elbows may have been even better. And this goes on for a while, and finally he's like, do they do anything else? <laughs> because yes, for the record, let it be known that in August of 1986, James E. Cornette made fun of a tag team because their move set was too limited. It's Bobby Jaggers, physically beyond hideous in this match. How is he not a heel? I, I don't know. Bouncing boobs, fat, grotesque. Terrible bleach blonde hair. Terrible bleach job. And he's in there with Mantel, who wrestles much better, has a much better physique, and is much hairier, though. Well, that is true. This is not a pretty boy tag team. No, it's not. No. Nor was Mulkey. Was wearing well. these fucking green tights. <laughs> the story of this show is everyone's gear, as I will get to as we go on. But Mulkey is one of them. See, part of this is that when I came up in wrestling, you would send an order into, for example, stagecoach boots. Mm -hmm. You would design your gear. I presume it's still the same way with high spots. I don't even know how they do it nowadays. But point is, you had to think about it. And you had to maybe sketch it. You had to have a plan in your mind that you then sent to the individual who was going to create your gear. This fucking Mulkey decided, I need gear that's vomit green. Can you please supply that for me? As a father of a newborn, you can attest to this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he got it. He sure shit did. So Corna interviews the Russians. Khrushchev is boring. I haven't said Magnum's latest win is bullshit. Then Nikita starts running down Magnum, and I'm looking at this. And the background's in focus, and Ivan's in focus, but Nikita is blurry. This goes on for a while before they figure this out and cut to another camera. So, Welcome to live television. Live television in 1986. Nikita vowed to bury Magnum in a hole and kick dirt on top of him. And win the USA title. The USA title. <laughs> I love when he calls it that. If I were a Russian, I'd add an A. <laughs> Jimmy Valiant came out for a promo. Now, if you have never seen a Jimmy Valiant promo, 
And you watch this madman come out here and scream. You think, boy, this guy's crazy. As someone who watches this man every week, believe me, he was very subdued here. He was very calm. This is almost as subdued as you've ever seen him. He vowed to beat Paul Jones and shave his head by the end of the year or quit pro wrestling. That's right. He, he mentioned, I have never done anything else in my life. The only thing that I know how to do is wrestle. But I will quit if I do not shave Paul Jones. And then he starts talking about how Paul Jones will never take this match. He's never going to step into the ring with me. And with each passing moment, I thought, well, this is a pretty stupid fucking plan, isn't it now, Jimmy Valiant? What is your fucking plan? Well, we do know he's stupid. Because somewhere in here he mentioned, I've got to get this done by the end of the year. There's only two or three months left. Yeah. And I checked. is 30 years ago this week. Yeah. The middle of August, 1986. He's got four and a half months left. <laughs> Maybe this was so long ago that they hadn't invented November and October yet. Is that possible? I think it's more likely he was... On, uh, under the influence of something. Really? I think he just couldn't add. Or he may just have been that dumb. Because later, Paul Jones came out, and he also thought that there were three months left in the year. That is true. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> this is now two sources. <laughs> That's true. We have fact-checked this. So this could be the Mandela effect, <laughs> that back in 1986, in that timeline, August was three months away from the end of the year. I don't know what... Months did not exist back in 1986, but clearly there were only three months left. Maybe the Crockett promotions took the holidays off. Could have been. Hmm. The Road Warriors versus Pablo Crenshaw and Tom Pittman. This went about 15 seconds. I don't think Animal touched either of them. Hawk beat them up and pinned Pittman with a clothesline. Tony Schiavone interviewed Dick Murdoch. You know what I got out of this Dick Murdoch deal? Do you remember when you used to have Trevor Murdoch? Yes. He looked a lot like Dick Murdoch. That was the plan. It didn't hit me until I watched it today. I was like, this fucker looks exactly, well, the other way around. Yeah. And boy, did they not do anything with Trevor Murdoch. No. It's Dick Murdoch. Dick Murdoch was better, to be fair. <laughs> he was better than Trevor. He was. Now, I say that, not in reference to this promo. All he did was come out here and say... He put over everyone on the roster, how, how tough they were. Said he had a title match with Ric Flair tomorrow. He hoped he could win. That was it. They recapped the angle from Kansas City where Tully Blanchard and Ric Flair attacked Dusty Rhodes. And then Blanchard and Dylan did a promo once again denying there had been any conspiracy. And I once again wonder, why does it matter? Because it does. <laughs> it's just, I just what heels did. honestly don't know. Tully did the classic Ric Flair interview, which is you put over how awesome the babyface is, but note that he's not quite as good as any of the horsemen. That's right. He did that. He talked about how great Dusty was. So they show the finish of Flair's championship win in St. Louis. So Dusty's going into this with a bad leg after the Kansas City attack. You know this bad leg? So we have Tony Schiavone and David Crockett doing commentary. And Tony Schiavone is calling all of the spots. David Crockett only calls spots when Dusty is in control. Yes. And he's not calling spots, by the way. He's marking out. Yes. Now, he also... There's a million excuses for why Dusty Rhodes lost this match. But as a rattle-off excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse, they always add that Dusty would never use any of these things That's right. as an excuse. That is right. <laughs> I was like, Jesus. And then he's like, Dusty's not moving outside because his leg hurts. He has an excuse for everything, including Dusty Rhodes' complete immobility during matches. Yes, yeah, they did note, Dusty had a chance here to take a count-out loss, but chose to get in the ring and keep fighting. So Flair's working the leg. Dusty starts making a comeback, and he's limping around, throwing elbows and punches. And he hits the same lariat that won the match in Kansas City, and he makes the cover, but this time the ref sees Flair's leg on the ropes. But Dusty doesn't realize the ref has seen this, so Dusty thinks he has gotten the three count and won, and he jumps up to his foot and begins to celebrate, but Flair chop blocks him and hooks the figure four. Out runs Magnum to cheerlead. He runs down to ringside to cheer Dusty on, 
and Dusty fights and Dusty fights and Dusty fights and he manages to finally, finally roll the figure four over and then they just do a full revolution. They're back where they started and this time Dusty's done and the ref counts three and Dusty has lost the world championship. And for the record, because we always talk about how it's the least effective finisher ever, at least one time Ric Flair's figure four did in fact win the world title. We can confirm that. Here it is. We, we have seen it happen now. Yes. So they go back to the studio, and there's Ric Flair in the fattest ass white suit you ever saw. Dude, I'm ready to renew my vows after seeing that suit. <laughs> you must, if, <laughs> if you do, go get one of those. If you do, you must, you must uh, recreate every detail of this, including the shirt un, uh, unbuttoned to mid sternum to display the giant gold medallion. I thought you were going to say it after recreate all of it, including spending forty thousand dollars on a diamond ring to give you. We'll get to that. Ah. We'll get to that. Remember 1986, not 76. Oh, yeah. He's another this huge medallion. Dude, wrestling is 10 years behind it the times is. in terms of style. It always is. Which means I am always 10 years behind the times in terms of style. So Flair does exactly what you said uh, Tully did earlier. Says Dusty's, Dusty was a great champion. In a company full of tough men, Dusty was the toughest of them all. It's not my fault that Tully had attacked Dusty's leg. The bottom line is, I faced the great champion, I defeated a great champion, now I am world champion once again. You know what I loved also is it is exactly, as I talked about last week, when Flair is not the champion and his back is against the wall, it's no bullshit. He's out there, it's deadly serious, it's all about trying to get that championship back. Because I believe even Dusty noted it later, everything about this man is built around him being the champion. His women, his suits, his gold rings, everything. When Ric Flair is the champion, he's on top of the world. He don't give a shit about nothing. He's out there laughing and joking and having fun, but you take that belt off him, he ain't Ric Flair anymore. And so his singular goal is to get the belt back so that he can be himself again. That's what he was here, in his white fucking sweet-ass suit. He did, in fact, mention that he's going to go home with some women later. He g- also, gave their names. I didn't write them down. <laughs> I also learned here. Did he give their names? Wow. Well, first names. That's too... I, I wish we could have checked to see if they were the same chicks that won the Rock oh, and Roll of that. contest. <laughs> that. Oh, that would have been great. I learned here that the NWA stands for Men Wrestling. <laughs> Is that what he said? I didn't know that. Huh. Yeah. Paul Ellering and the Road Warriors got a promo. Ellering just talked about all the awards and titles they had won. Animal plugged their return to Wisconsin and Minnesota, this time with the world's best wrestling company. And then Hawk runs down the horseman. Paul Ellering said more in the first 10 seconds of this promo than he has said in his entire run in yes. NXT. Yes. And probably more than he will say in his entire run. So to clarify, there are two guys in NXT with no names who have a manager who doesn't talk. Yeah. <laughs> the fuck is happening? I don't know. And it's been months. I don't know. It's been a long time. And it's not like he can't talk. No. The guy can cut a promo. Yeah. He knows how to get big, scary guys over. He's done it before. Superstar Bill Dundee versus Vernon Dean. <laughs> oh, my God. Dundee looked like a young super porky, but shorter. <laughs> he wasn't that fat. He, no, a young... Super Porky, when he was young, was not fat. I see. I mean, he was a little... He looked like Bill Dundee. Well, I'm glad I brought that up then. Yeah. Because, I mean, how can a guy named Super Porky ever not be fat? Well, he he was Brazo de Plata. Yes. And so later, he was Super Porky. Right. Uh, They showed a baseball pitch in the crowd who had, like, the worst hairdo I've ever seen. It wasn't a mullet. It wasn't a crew cut. It was just there. Like, like It was like 10 days of bedhead all at once. I don't know. It's Dundee claimed he was 5'7". <laughs> Give me a break. How tall are you? That I'm 5'6 and a half. Yeah. There's it's... no fucking way <laughs> that I'm shorter than Bill Dundee. He looked at least maybe, maybe 5'4". And he did the thing that the guys did back in the day when you were short. You had to put on weight. Yeah. You had to compensate. Mm-hmm. So then you end up short and fat. Which Basically, is the worst combination. He was a fire plug here, that's for sure. Yeah. I like when he's doing a boring squash match on a Saturday afternoon, and he's got the win with an elbow smash, but then the ref drops counts one, the ref counts two, and he picks the guy up. 
Why did he pick the guy up? So he could put him back in an arm bar, baby. <laughs> Eventually, he won with a top rope sit-down splash. Actually, I need to clarify that because the setup for this was he whipped this guy in and gave him a clothesline, but he had zero faith in this guy taking this clothesline convincingly and being where he wanted him to be. So he threw this clothesline as if this man had never been trained at all. In other words, he threw this clothesline to take the guy's head off. He hit him so hard that he hit a top rope, sit down, splash, and won. Bill Apter interviewed Dusty <laughs> in Dusty's first interview since losing the title. Dusty Rhodes said that he had let down the country yes. when he lost this title. He said that millions... Dusty did not say that millions of people around the country were upset that he lost the world championship to Ric Flair. What he said was, millions of people around the country must now regroup over yeah. this issue. Yes. <laughs> Their lives have been torn asunder by his loss of the championship, and now they must regroup. This national tragedy, him losing the belt to Ric Flair. He says there's a lot of regional champions in wrestling and a lot of movie stars who claim to be world champions, but the NWA title is the most prestigious title in all of sports. I don't know why they were so pissed off at Hogan here. This was the second time on the show they talked about champions being movie stars. It had to have been the A-Team. A-Team, well, it was 86. When did Rocky Three come out? 85. Okay, well, so I was not, not new. And it wasn't No Holds Barred. That was later. Many years later. I don't know other than just making sure that the fans knew their world title was the world title that mattered. Uh, anyway, he's made no excuses. My injury did not matter. Ric Flair was the better man for three seconds on that night. And he says, I may have lost some fans, but any fans who have never had anything bad happen to them in three seconds, well, you're a liar. That's what he said. And he knew he, knew he could beat Flair, so he's just going to have to do it again. But first, he must take out Tully Blanchard. Yes, Tully Blanchard to take out his leg. That's a good way to get the focus off Flair. Mm -hmm. Now Dusty can go do something else. And Flair can keep feuding with Ronnie fucking Garvin <laughs> for another year and a half. <laughs> Cornette interviewed Paul Jones. Jones again tried to recruit Manny Fernandez into his army, but said Manny had uh, not accepted his offer, which showed Manny had more talent than brains. He said the fans were chanting for a bald-headed geek. That meant they were calling for Jimmy Valiant. So he was not afraid to face Jimmy Valiant. He would face him anywhere, anytime. He wanted to get his hands on Valiant, slap him around, humiliate him, and make him quit wrestling. He finishes his promo. And Cornette's interviewing him. And Cornette pulls the mic back and says, Let's go to the ring for the shick match of the week. <laughs> Did you also think he said the shit match of the week? Because <laughs> that's what I thought he said. Very briefly. And then when they showed the lineup, I was sure of it. <laughs> I want to know how much Schick Razor Products paid to endorse the Andersons and Tully Blanchard versus Toddy Champion. Toddy. Like a hot toddy. Sam Houston and Italian Stallion. They paid too much. I can tell you that much right now. So we got every generic six-man squash from Saturday Night ever. Got a sugar hold. There was, in fact, a sugar hold. It was great. Okay, now i got to talk about all these trunks. Okay. I've mentioned this before. I'll never not laugh at Ole Anderson's trunks. This big, gruff, tough guy, Ole Anderson, calls some company or he talks to some seamstress and he wants a pair of trunks red with three white stars across the front and two white stars on the back. Why does Ole Anderson give this much of a shit about his trunks? You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know. Tully Blanchard, whose gimmick is that he is a high roller, wears an absolutely blank pair of black <laughs> trunks with a TB and script on them, which I presume is Tully Blanchard and not tuberculosis. But that's it. Ole has to have fucking stars and colors on his trunks. It's so out of character. He also has striped boots. Yeah! I don't know if he wore them this week or not, but he has worn them before. So they're doing every six-man squash on Saturday night you ever saw. And they go to a break. I'm thinking, oh, God, why do they go to a break? And they come back, and within 15 seconds of coming back from the break, Arn pins champion with Igor Buster. 
Why did they go to break? Why not just do the finish before the commercial? Well, they had to mix it up. They didn't want you to leave, and so they made sure to leave the match <laughs> in session. I've got to see what happens. Yeah. Maybe Todd Champion will get the win. Toddy Champion will get the win. So the next match was Dick Murdoch versus Tony Zane, and Dick won with a brain buster in 15 seconds. Maybe 15. Now I have no idea why that horseman match needed the extra 30 seconds for they that they got. Cornette interviews the Andersons. Ovi is wearing a shirt reading, Evil, Mean, and Nasty. There's another one. He's got this shirt on. E- it says, Evil, Mean, and Nasty. He Clearly, he designed this at the mall. Oh, this is a mall-made t-shirt if ever I've seen one. And he made sure that Mean was red. Yes. And the other words were in white. Why? I don't have any fucking idea. He had a design in mind when he went to the mall. Inside Ole Anderson. Is a poet. A man of fashion. Sure. <laughs> an artiste. A dandy. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> There's a man who was interested in colors, textures, shapes. Now, he had to go beat people up to make a living and put food on the table. But all he really cared about was clothes. I can just imagine the design of his home. <laughs> And the way he sets his table at night before dinner. A lot of feng shui going on. You make sure that the fork is on the left and the spoon on the right and the knife is in the middle with the blade pointing towards the fork. Uh Uh-huh. It's the way it's done in the Anderson household. So Arne does all the talking here. Says Dusty calls himself the American dream, but in reality, the only way to achieve the American dream is to go out, go to the gym, make something something of yourself, and then whatever you want, you got to take it from somebody else. He finishes up and only just gives a thumbs up and they leave. <laughs> you have to be a man's man, he said. Mm-hmm. So Cornette's been out there for the entire show, and Bubba's been behind him for the entire show as his bodyguard. Then the Midnight Express come out so Cornette can cut a promo for them. <laughs> Let's talk about their outfit. I don't even know where to start. Eaton is wearing a blue button-up shirt, and when I say blue, I mean ocean blue. The bluest blue you've ever seen. Tucked into his jeans. Yes. With his amazing mullet. Dennis Condry is wearing a white button-up shirt with the sleeves rolled up with his mullet, and he's going bald on top. Uh Uh-huh. And they are both bedecked in gold and jewels, and they sit there with their belts, and they stare creepily into the camera <laughs> did you the note whole time Dennis Condry's pleated slacks I did not see the pleated slacks pleated slacks now this is not quite as outrageous the time, as the time they put Bobby Eaton on camera in a red disco jumpsuit <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is God bless them there are two southern rednecks and them wearing anything other than blue jeans and NASCAR t-shirts is silly dude I'll bet you anything that Eaton could move on the dance floor he can move I, in the ring I'll bet you anything yeah so, Cornette's whole promo was that... Now I can't stop thinking about the Midnight Express staring at me. <laughs> blankly. <laughs> they do. They look at you. Like they're a, just watching you they, the whole time. They have just a little bit of a smile. like They don't know what they're supposed to do. So, they showed footage from another show where Cornette was confronting Baby Doll. He wanted Baby Doll to get Dusty to apologize to Cornette's mother. Also, to admit that Baby Doll was fat and ugly. Baby Doll said, Dusty never apologized to anyone. Cornet gave her one more chance. I'm asking you to ask Dusty Rose to apologize to my mother. And she said no. So Bubba Rogers grabs her and he throws her to the ground. And immediately, Dusty Rhodes comes out of the shadows. He has a steel chair in his hand. He swings it at Big Bubba's back and he waffles the man. This was swinging for the fences. It wasn't even the back. It was the back of his fucking head. Yeah. Oh, my God. He just waffled him. And then a brawl breaks out, Mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure that Big Bubba was trying to kill Dusty Rhodes. That is entirely possible. And all of the geeks had to come out and save Dusty's life. That is entirely possible. This was like the Shibata brawl at G1, for those of you that saw that. Just maybe crazier. And I'll bet you anything that the chair shot at the back of the head was scarier than Shibata's headbutt earlier in the match. This was madness. The Russians versus Randy Barber and Paul Garner 
and Clement Fields. <laughs> Clement Fields was his name. Clement Fields is not a venue. It's not a building. It's not a park where a wrestling event is held. It's a wrestler himself, Clement Fields. He worked like a fucking building. If it's the... <laughs> Assuming it's the guy we're thinking of, because there were two men in the match, we know Paul, Paul Garner, he's the big Abe Lincoln looking dude. Yeah. There was a black guy and a white guy. They beat up Paul Garner for a while. He makes the tag to the black guy. The black guy hits the ring, the most excited wrestler you ever saw. This may have been his first match ever, and he couldn't wait. And he steps to the ropes, and he is moving as fast as he can, and he runs across the ring as fast as he can. And Nikita Koloff hits the top, hits him in the top of the head with an axe handle, and it appears that all of his bones turn to jelly. <laughs> he didn't bump. He didn't fall. He melted. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Just quickly. My, my first thought was he crumbled. But then I realized, no, he didn't crumble. He did, in fact, melt. There was a definite liquid motion. <laughs> there was a definite bleh. Yes. Is what happened. And then Nikita hit a sickle to finish him off, and the other white guy never even dagged in. They showed Magnum beating Nikita to make the series 3-3. Somewhere in this commentary, David Crockett got so excited he called Magnum by his real name. Terry. Terry. <laughs> so sweet. You know what's funny about this is, this may have been the first time in the two years that we have watched this show that I've actually seen Magnum work. Because every time he does a squash, it's an immediate belly-to-belly. -belly. Pretty much, yes. <laughs> so here he was actually doing moves. There was that Christmas show. It was him and, he, was, he had he had an A-plus oh, match with Oli. Oh, yeah, only. that's right. But that was six months ago. That was a long-ass time ago. Yeah. But yes, we got to see Magnum do wrestling matches. Or a wrestling match here. So, Khrushchev interferes. The ref gets bumped. Nikita hits a sickle. And a second ref runs in to count the pin... But Magnum's leg was under the ropes, and the original ref saw this. David Crockett notes, it's not just his foot, it's his whole leg. It's his whole leg. Yes. It's practically his whole body. He's practically on the floor. So Nikita is celebrating, and the second ref is raising his hand, but the original ref jumps up, throws both their hands down, and Nikita's confused. Magnum grabs him, hits a belly-to-belly -belly for the win, and I am now out of words to describe 1980s Jim Crockett Promotions crowd reactions. It was insane. I don't even know how to describe this. I, I, it, it's Every week, it seems bigger than the last. <laughs> but none of the mics they had had the capacity to withstand this noise. Yeah. This sound pressure level, as they called it. I can only assume that all these wrestlers on this crew must have suffered long-term hearing damage from this kind of noise night after night. It's not healthy. No. <laughs> it's not good for you. So then we're back in the studio. Seriously, everybody, if you're listening to this, if you don't watch this stuff, go back to this show mm -hmm. 30 years ago this week. Fast, The show's only an hour long. Fast forward 50 minutes in and watch the reaction when Magnum hits a belly-to-belly. And let me tell you something. When he hits the belly to belly, it's like the loudest pop you've ever heard in your whole lifetime. And then when he gets the pin, it's twice as loud. It's much louder. <laughs> it's unbelievable. You can't. And I mentioned I was worried about the, the wrestlers and their ears. I'm also worried about the fans and their throats. I'm worried about all the equipment they burned all out. All the equipment they burned That's out. That's where they went out of business. None of this can be any good, but it's spectacular. And there's nothing like it today. Nothing. People like are listening today. to this that don't watch this, and they don't believe us. But I'm, I'm telling you right now, there's nothing. There's not. There's no WrestleMania moment. No. There's no championship change. There's nothing like the reaction that Magnum got for this belly-to-belly -belly and pinfall. Steve Austin could, could come out on Raw and stun Roman Reigns twice. It would be not approach this. No, not even close. So they go back to the studio. And there's Baby Doll in the most 1980s shirt you ever saw. It's teal, and there's like purple triangles on it. And she's there with Magnum for a promo. Magnum just says, look, I fell behind 0-3 in this series, but I fall the way, fought all the way back, and now it's tied. We're right back where we started. We're done at one match to finish it all, and he vows to get it done for the USA. Great promo. It was a great promo. He wasn't an all-time great or anything, but goddamn, he was just he was very, very good at everything. There needs to, in all sports, there should be a Hall of Fame and then a Hall of Very Good. Sure. And Magnum T is absolutely a Hall of Very Good guy. 
It was time to reveal Miss 1986 Rock and Roll Express and her court. They claim there were 18,000 people here. It looked like the Rock and Roll Express and Tony Schiavone were at a nightclub mm -hmm. holding handheld mics. They had stands. But calling these six girls, I believe it was. It, it looked like any uh, above-average karaoke bar you've ever seen. Yeah, it looked like your average bikini contest at your average just random bar anywhere yeah. on a Thursday night. Not even a Friday night. So the Express are up there. They've got the uh, short sleeve button-ups tucked into their jeans and, of course, their mullets. I got to say, the girls were all hot. They, they, they were, and as a connoisseur of 1980s women, they were 1980s hot. Shoulder pads and giant hair everywhere. Kisses on the lips all around. They, Tony, Tony reads off the names, and these lovely young women, and I say that because in the contest, it made, I thought we were going to see teenagers, but at least, at least visually, these all appear to be young women. They all came out. They kissed. They smiled and waved. They kissed Ricky on the mouth. They kissed Robert on the mouth. And they got in line. Well, if you recall, there were several contests. There was the contest with the over 21s, if I recall correctly. I hope so. And then the teenagers, like, all went to Disneyland or some bullshit. Yes. I forget what the contest was, but they were definitely separated by age. I, I, I remember when they did this announcement, all the complicated rules, and the vision I had in my head was much creepier than what this actually came across on TV. Well, we only saw this. That's true. <laughs> we did not <laughs> see them at Disneyland with the teeny boppers. No, we did not. Maybe that's next week. So they brought them all up, and then uh, there was like five or six of them, and the last one was, in fact, Miss Rockwell Express, and they they kissed them on the lips, they got in line, they smiled, they were very nervous, and then they all left together. And I believe as they left, one of them wiped away a tear as she left the I, stage. I saw at least one doing that at some point. <laughs> and then they go back for this match, which is the Rock and Rolls versus Bill Tab and Art Pritz. And the very first thing Cornette says is, those are the ugliest cows I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Couldn't believe the Rock and Roll Express lowered themselves to, to hang out with those women. Art Pritz was horrible in this match. Oh, my God. He was fucking visually hideous and a horrible wrestler. He was so bad, there were times I could not tell what the Rock and Roll Express were even trying to do. He had a bald eagle mullet, a massive faux pas, a huge-ass beard... Because I guess he was trying to compensate for no hair on the top of his head by growing a fucking beard. And then, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but the tips of his mullet were bleached. I can't say I caught that. That escaped my notice. The Rock and Rolls won with the double drop kick. So the Four Horsemen are out for another promo. And Ole didn't speak earlier when he was out there with Arn, and this was his turn to go. And he was great. He says Dusty Rhodes has lost his title, and they're not done taking things away from Dusty yet. His leg is only the beginning. They're going to break his other leg. They're going to break both arms. And he's still got his head to work on, too. They're going to take it all away. And they vow once again to put Dusty out of wrestling for good. So he finishes, and Corner takes the mic, and he turns and holds it to uh, Dylan. And Dylan just points at Tully. So Cornette waves it back the other side to Tully. And Tully seems totally off guard by this. And he laughs, he makes fun of Cornette for waving it around, and he apparently ad-libs a story about getting together with a horseman at Flair's cabin in, uh, or condo in uh, Myrtle Beach in South Carolina. And Flair steps in, and Flair says the horsemen all got together. The four of us all chipped in $10,000 apiece to buy this for J.J. Dillon, and he holds out a giant diamond ring. So, yes, I believe J.J. and the Horsemen are now engaged. $40,000 gold ring, baby. Eight, 1986, $40,000, by right. the way, I do. Yeah, it's that's like $120,000 now. yeah. nowadays. Dylan is moved. He gladly accepts the ring. says, every time I wear this, I'm going to think about you guys. And he says, I think for the first time on camera, somebody said this. Diamonds are forever, and so are the Four Horsemen. Man. And they all celebrated together. What a historic week for these shows. Retro Raw was historic, Retro Nitro was historic, and now this show is historic. And I got to tell you, J.J. Dillon was so much better in the 80s than in that run in WCW in the 90s. It's like a different guy. It really is. It's like the Ultimate Warrior that allegedly died and was replaced by a more horrible version. It seems like what happened here, but it's the same guy. It's honestly the same thing as Crusher Crusher versus Smash. That's true. That's true. Although we haven't gone back and watched Smash. It could turn out that Smash there are, sucked. There are points in the past 20 years when I have. You have to remember that Axe was great, 
And they had a great theme that may have covered for Smash. I assure you, Smash was better than Crusher Khrushchev. Well. In every way. It would be hard to not be. promise you that. Hey, it was years later. Boss Man a couple years later was awesome. That's true. And he was fucking horrible as Big Bubba. Yeah. Or whatever he was before he was Big Bubba. Just Ray Trailer. Yeah, Ray Taylor, I think they called him. May have been. Because we can't give the guy his real name. Ray Taylor, though. Okay. All right, everybody. That's it for today. That's the one and only. All right. Until we know more, let's just move on. Lance, let's start with NWA World Championship Wrestling. Do you want to lead the review in the vein of Vinny, or should I? Uh, I think you probably should, because I I made really minor notes just with a few thoughts that I wanted to. All righty. NWA World Championship Wrestling. This was 30 years ago this week, so August 25 or something like that of 1986. It opened with clips of Baby Doll turning on Dusty. And Tony and David Crockett opened up the show, and they noted that Baby Doll had turned. She was now with Flair. And also, there are new NWA World Tag Team Champions, the Rock and Roll Express, and David Crockett was so goddamn excited. He was literally giddy and jumping up and down because <laughs> the Rock and Roll Express won the World Tag Team titles. He was so happy. And they also noted that Nikita won the best of seven. Nikita is your new U.S. champion, having defeated Magnum TA, and they said we would see footage of that later on in the evening. Rock and Roll Express faced Mike Rose and Phil Brown. I believe it went like 10 seconds. Rock and Rolls hit the double drop kick, and it was over. David Crockett's so excited, and they did an interview afterwards, and what is there to say other than Robert Gibson is horrible? <laughs> he was not a good promo. Although, by the standards of if the crowd loves it, it's over and it's great, he's awesome. Because the crowd was so into these two guys. We were talking about the Rock and Roll Express on the way down here. Every year I voted for the Rock and Roll Express. Because when I was wrestling, I was a little baby face. And so everybody would always say, you've got to watch Ricky Morton. You've got to watch Ricky Morton. You've got to watch the Rock and Roll Express. You've got to learn how to be a babyface. Watch the Rock and Roll Express. So I thought, well, influence is a big deal. i got to vote for the Rock and Roll Express. No one ever did. They never got in. Finally, they get in. Now I'm watching them. Now <laughs> you're watching Robert Gibson. That, now the key to this is, Ricky Morton is so great that I would not rescind my vote for the Rock and Roll Express. Yeah. Which should tell you how great he was because Robert Gibson was the other half of the Rock and Roll Express. And God bless the guy. Sure, he's a nice guy. Robert Gibson should not be in the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame. Yeah. Everybody talks about the being the Marty of the t- team. And I suppose it's more because Sean went on to be the greatest ever and Marty really dropped off the face of the earth. But when you look at prospective talent and relative talent between team members... I would rather be Marty Jannetty than Robert Gibson. Um, and I, I, I've i worked, well, I haven't worked them, but I've been on shows with them. I know both guys. They're great guys. But, yeah, Ricky, really just a phenomenal worker, one of the best promos. And if that dude was, what, four to six inches taller and had a body, he'd have been a world champion. Oh, yeah. Ricky was phenomenal. Cornette was with Big Bubba. They had clips of Magnum losing. Essentially, Ivan interfered, Ivan Koloff. Magnum goes outside, kills the guy with a pile driver on the cement. Place goes crazy, totally losing their shit. Then we get the worst belly-to-belly ever, totally mistimed. Referee goes down. Magnum goes over there, and Nikita gets up and grabs the Russian chain. And he waffles Magnum with a lariat using the chain, makes the cover. The ref wakes up, counts the pin. The heat for this was out of this world. Not the loudest I've ever heard. If you've been going back and watching these shows, this is not one where I'll say, go back and you'll you'll have never heard anything like this. It's not like that. But compared to anything today, unbelievable. Oh, it blows everything away today. And it was interesting, too, because when Nikita wrapped his arm in the Russian chain, he hopped up on the second rope like he's going to come off the, the turnbuckle with the, the Russian sickle. And I don't know whether he just didn't think... Uh, Magnum was close enough, or whether he just was in a rush, he just jumps down, charges over, and tears uh, Magnum's head off with the with the the sickle. And yeah, people were just standing and screaming. And it's you, you if you've never seen stuff from this area, you got to go back and watch what real crowd heat is because it's just amazing. 
I actually have no idea where this goes other than Magnum getting in a car wreck. But when you look at the story of the best of seven where Magnum, the American, was down like three to one or whatever it was. He fights his way back and here in the final match, he had it won, but he got screwed. And the Russian wins the U.S. title by hitting him with the Russian chain. There is no better setup for now a Russian chain match where Magnum beats the Russian in his own match to win the U.S. title. Yeah, although we did, I should just go back real quick. We, we, it was um, Crusher Khrushchev that got up on the apron that was the distraction to draw Magnum. And the just the most awkward spot of Magnum trying to pull uh, Crusher Khrushchev into the ring uh, while Nikita got his chain. But yeah, that would have been an awesome bill. Because we're, how close are we to the car wreck? Pretty quick? I think we're very close. I think we're very close. Russian's promo, Ivan is there selling his neck. It's so funny because I was looking at him and I was like, that ain't a neck brace, dude. You've wrapped a white towel around your neck. And then later in the interview, he admits, I got a towel around my neck because I guess the idea is this goddamn Russian is so tough, he didn't go to the doctor. He got a towel and he made his own neck brace. Fighters heal quicker than normal men, Brian. You know, they do. So he's selling his neck and... Nikita wants more competition. He says he's done with Magnum. Challenges Ron Garvin. And then Ivan did this great promo. And suffice to say, I don't think Ron Garvin is next. At I'm, least not in the storyline. He may be after the car wreck. That's one thing that I've really noticed from this era. And I guess it's because they, they do a lot of live events. And whenever there's a promo, they talk about all the different challengers they have. It's not like today where it's just... Ziggler and whoever will be feuding for the next three months. It's everyone talks about, I'll be facing this guy and this guy and this guy. And everyone's talking about the four or five challengers they've got on their plate. Uh, and there's lots of these promos coming up. Clement Fields, my new favorite jobber. Paul Garner and Bill Tab against Tully Arn and Ole. I'm sure you can figure out what happened. They destroyed Clement Fields and they beat him with the Gord Buster. He never managed a tag. No, he did not. Like every segment on this show, I think every segment goes like one minute. I think we get 44 se uh, segments in a one-hour show. Literally, the time between segments on this show is much, much shorter than the time between segments on this NWA television program. Yeah, this makes TNA to the back feel like they're dragging their feet. Yes, it does, actually. Clips of Flair and Dusty. So what happened was, Dusty got what appeared to be the pin... But Baby Doll put Flair's foot on the ropes. The crowd goes crazy. Flair chop blocks the knee. Dusty, by the way, so amazingly immobile. Like, we talk about Shinsuke Nakamura and how he does as little as necessary to have a great match. Dusty did as little as necessary to have a match. <laughs> like, <laughs> But he, was over like crazy. It was nuts. He did nothing. So... Flair put on the figure four. Dusty tried to turn it over, but Baby Doll prevented it. So Dusty fired up. Referee took a bump. Dusty had the win, but no ref. And then Baby Doll hit the ring and tried to waffle Dusty. So he avoids her. He grabs a chair she's got, starts destroying Flair's knee, and the ref wakes up and calls for the bell. He didn't even do a job. It was a disqualification. So Tully hit the ring afterwards, destroyed Dusty with a chair. Magnum and the Rock and Roll Express make the save. Place goes crazy. And Baby Doll leaves arm in arm with Tully and Rick. Yeah, when the baby faces hit the ring, it's 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 what Jim Cornette refers to as the throwing babies in the air. Yeah. It's like the crowd just jumping up and down, arms flailing, people just jumping. It's crazy. And, and it's interesting, and, and it's, it's something you don't see very often, but they really protected their baby faces back in the day. They do the beat downs, and it's not like Dusty got up and made his own comeback, but they usually sent the baby faces to the ring so that the crowd had a moment of celebration at the end of segments. And I think it really helped make the show feel positive or the, you know, the live event, the crowd, whatever. It's like giving the crowd those chances to have a moment to go, yeah, okay, you know, things are still going our way. And Dusty didn't make it, so we still want to see Dusty get his revenge, but we got to see Magnum and the Rock and Roll come out and save the day. Crockett was outraged. Man, this guy was so mad. Flair and Baby Doll did a promo. Flair said it was inevitable that sooner or later the blonde bomber and the blonde bombshell would walk the aisle together. I guess they're getting married. Apparently. Yeah. He says, we all know Baby Doll likes nice cars and pretty clothes. And she agrees. I am, in fact, a high-end escort, Rick. 
pretty much. My that's fa- been her. That's been her gimmick. Yeah, she was Dusty's personal. Yep. And now she's uh, uh, my favorite line of the promo at the end when he talked about that it's going to be the four horsemen and the one mare. So she's, oh <laughs> so wow! She's, she's really just there, uh, taking one from the team, I guess. She says, "If you're not a champion, you're nothing to her." She's a champion, and now she is with the champion. She notes she always wanted to ride Space Mountain. Never liked Magnum's skinny little neck and skinny little arms as Rick. She says that he likes her. She likes a real man. Diamonds are forever, and so is Baby Doll. This led to Magnum TA and Art Pritz. I was stunned he did three moves. Yeah, this was a long Magnum squash match because <laughs> yeah. it went 45 seconds. He had a backdrop, a drop kick, and a belly to belly. Yeah, Magnum didn't get paid by the hour, that's for sure. No. And apparently not by the move. <laughs> Paul Ellering promo. Plugged some shows. He says, you know, we talk about things in the past and things in the future that we don't know about yet. <laughs> yeah, this promo like, really what? this promo really didn't go very far, and I don't know what was up with his outfit, but it looked like he had little clouds on his chest. Yeah, it was some sort of martial arts outfit. Ah, maybe it was... I don't know what the clouds had to do with anything. But yeah, this this was another promo that really just didn't go very far. Kent Glover and Lee Peak against the Road Warriors. This was awesome. Oh my god. Road Warriors are going way too fast and they nearly kill these guys. Animal tries a press slam outside and it gets fucked up. Nearly killing the dude as he throws him back in the ring. Then Hawk does his drop kick and he lands right on top of the guy coming down. And then at the end... Hawk was considering tagging an animal, and I don't know if I don't know if animal just like gave him the wink, but Hawk just changed his mind and pinned the guy. Yeah, we don't need the doomsday device tonight. Let's animal just... does not get paid by the hour either. No, or the move. Or the move. He was like, "Dude, don't tag me in this fucking thing." Let's just beat these kids. It's enough. Hilariously bad match. And we got the Dusty promo. This man can deliver a promo. He said, "Baby doll is a common Jezebel from off the streets." Says, I carried her for 10 months, and now she wants to ride Space Mountain. He said something that got bleeped in the funniest manner possible. There was like the sound of like a, a clown spring and a just the fucking weirdest noise. I don't know what he said, but it ended with him saying, you being too fat to ride. We really should have checked YouTube. Maybe it Maybe That's that not was, a bad idea. It might not have been beeped in the original broadcast, but uh, the WWE Network... Uh, version has it beeped but yeah she's she's too fat to ride called out the horsemen said their time was coming big bubba you're gonna find your clothes strung all over the arena and you'll be in most of them jack great line it was a great promo and cornet with big bubba in the midnight express leading oh to the midnights against the goddamn mulkies yeah bubba was the highlight of this one I guess. Well, what happened was they won, and then Bubba tosses him into the ring. Now, Big Bubba had been a jobber, and this is 1987, okay? No, it's 86. 86, okay. But the point is, two years from now, he's going to be headlining cage matches all over America with Hulk Hogan in a main event spot. You presume he's all right by now. (laughs) He's not. fucking terrible. (laughs) Just about killed this poor dude. This boss man slam this guy did. Would you like to explain it? Yeah. Every- explain how it should be done, and then explain what happened. It's it's actually a pretty common rookie mistake. Um, everyone should know what the boss man slam is. It sends a guy off the rope, catches him under the, the arms, and basically gives him a It's the black hole slam that Abyss does. Yes. And he, so he's just as he picks the dude up, his legs and lower body is swinging up, and before... His lower body stops swinging up. He decides to start dropping his upper body down and gives him the rock bottom landing, but lands his dude so high on his shoulders and his head. Um, it happens quite a lot with rock bottoms and stuff, and even some choke slams. You get guys that are anxious, oh. and they they start they pick you up, and they don't realize that you're still going up and start pulling your head down. Um, it's something that I get hit with a lot because I tend to go up higher than most people. And they get anxious and bring you down, and Bubba just planted this dude on the back of his head and his shoulders, and it didn't get better from here. No, he kills this poor guy, splash off the middle ropes, almost killed him with that as well. 
you ever want to see a shoot splash, he basically got it right here. Yeah, he overshot him, so he couldn't really get his knees down, so he just squished this poor dude. And Bubba's not a small man. No. Now, normally, like, the segment's over and we go to the next thing, but they go to commercial, they come back, they're still trying to get this damn mulky out of the ring. He's... I shouldn't laugh, but I know they're alive, so I know he's okay. Well, man, no neck brace, no backboard. They just dragged his ass out of there and hauled him to the back. This poor Mulkey. Had a Magnum TA promo. He said he was not embarrassed, but he had a newfound determination. He could not believe the U.S. title is in the hands of a Russian, and he vowed to win the title back. Great babyface promo. And we got a good one next. Wahoo McDaniel and Randy Barber. Randy looks like Doc Gallows, you noted. Little, well, more Festus. That's true. More Festus, but yeah, he had the, the bad hairline and a beard. Yeah. Yeah, Festus, Festus was like 23 when he was Festus, right? Yeah. And he looked 43. <laughs> yeah, he, he had the hairline went early, so he had to shave it all off, but he had the old guy fryer fringe at like 23 or something. So this doesn't go very long. And Wahoo gives him a chop, and the guy takes a bump, and then Wahoo drops an elbow onto the mat. Missed him <laughs> by like eight, ten inches. He was he was nowhere near the guy. And then he covered him in one. And I thought, you know, that would have killed the business for me in 1986 if I would have seen that. I would have known it was fake. Now, I would presume that what happened was all the fans watching at home thought, well, you know, he hit him so hard with that chop. It didn't matter if he hit that elbow or not. The man was dead. Well, who could throw a chop? This dude could throw a chop, all right. And an elbow. He just missed. In a cornet promo. Clips of the tag team title change. They showed the match. I, I presume was this cornet that had the footage? Is that why it was so one-sided, or was it just a one-sided match? Do we know? I, I, I assume it was a one-sided match. I, I, they didn't say it was Jim Cornette's footage, so I'm assuming it was just arena footage. Well, basically, it was a Rock and Roll Express selling, 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 selling. And finally, Ricky well, Morton... Makes the hot tag for a change. Yep. Ricky was a legal man, but he was outside. And then he flew inside and got a flash pinfall, and that was the title change. And people were going batshit crazy. That's right. The Rock and Rolls won these belts. There's justice here in the world. Unlike when Dusty lost the title and people all over America are going to have to... What did he say? Regroup? I think that was it, yeah. Something like that. Ron Garvin, George South. With a Max Headroom reference. <laughs> and the best finish of all time. You remember it? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Garvin threw the boot to the stomach, and the job guy, whatever his name was, caught it. And Garvin just looked at him and punched him right in the face and knocked him out. <laughs> yeah, that was a finish. <laughs> That'll teach you. It was so great. Do not grab the boot of Ron Garvin when he goes to kick you. And then finally, in the main event, great. it was Dick Murdoch doing a promo. Oh, it was such a great, great promo. Great close to a show. He says, you know, Ric Flair, the clothes don't make the man. I'm here for all the folks that got to wear jeans and work eight to five. We all put on our trousers the same way. I don't even know what that means. Lots of folks around here can wrestle Flair's pants off, and I'm one of them. Which, by the way, they are doing that feud. I don't know if it's just arenas, but that is coming. He goes, I ain't got no fancy ride just an old pickup truck and a dog. And that's all I need. And then he's explaining how he's going to beat Ric Flair. He goes, Flair has a figure four. And if he gets it on you, it'll hurt. But me, you got to watch out for Big Bertha. And he holds his fist up because he's a country boy with a good right hand. He goes, you got to watch out for Big Bertha. And also the brain buster. <laughs> it's like the brain buster. So yeah, that was the end of the show. That well, was the main event. That wasn't the end of the show. We have the best closing line. As I mentioned earlier, he starts listing all the guys that are gunning for Ric Flair. And because it, I always thought it was a Sam Houston gimmick because Houston was never really a viable challenger. And he'd list all the guys that are in line for the title. And he mentions, you know, half a dozen different guys that are gunning for Ric Flair. He's got to put over Dusty, of course. And he finds a lot of people gunning for you. And he says, I think I got a match with you somewhere. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> that's right. I got a match with you somewhere coming up. But it was like, that was the closing line of the show. I think I got a match with you coming up. I don't know where, but I got one coming up somewhere. And it was true. 
Yeah. And you know what? I believe Dick Murdoch didn't know where he was going to wrestle Ric Flair. That's true. And as much as we're sort of half joking and uh, and making fun of uh, Dick Murdoch's promo, this dude was a phenomenal worker. Oh, dude, he was a great promo. Yeah, he it was, was funny, but it was a good promo. <laughs> but as a worker, this guy was phenomenal. He was great. At the one and only. Woo! We watched that, and then we watched NWA Championship Wrestling from August thirtieth, nineteen eighty six. Now, I missed a show last week due to SummerSlam. Oh, what a show. And you you did watch it, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Lance and I were right here in this car, oh. cuddling, talking about the matches. All right. Well, the pre-show here, you must have seen this match then. No. The Midnight Express get a win over Randy Mulkey and somebody. Oh, yeah, we did see this match. And so Randy Mulkey gets angry after, the, after he's been beaten. He gives Jim Cornette a shove. This is the worst mistake Randy Mulkey ever made, and think of the ground that covers. Big Bubba does what a bodyguard should do. He throws Randy Mulkey into the ring, whips him into the ropes, and the first time I believe Big Bubba ever did the Bubba Slam, the most violent Bubba Slam you ever saw, he picked this man up and drove him head first into the mat, and I howled with laughter. Every now and then there's a move. Every now and then there's a move. There's a move. When Lance and I watched this, <laughs> we both just did a flip over the couch. The moment you saw this, you screamed at the top of your lungs. Yeah. No human could watch this and not realize that this Mulkey had to have died. Oh, yeah. The, the... Bubba grabs him. The dude's <laughs> feet are still on the way up when he decides to yeah. shove his upper body and head into the mat. Yes. Oh, my God. You know what I will say, though? If I were the Mulkey, thank God they replayed this the next week. Yes. To have died in vain <laughs> is the worst way to go. Yes. This man did not die in vain. He got over... Big Bubba. So this show was off to a great start. They announced that Wahoo McDaniel had defeated Tully Blanchard in Los Angeles to win the national championship. And Jim Cornette's out there being the guest host again. Oh, you got to watch the last week's show. Not only for Bubba, but you've got to see Wahoo do an elbow drop. Missed by, I swear to God, a full foot and a half. Like, he's nowhere close to the guy's head. Okay. And that's the finish. Yeah, so he just pinned him anyway? They did it on television. <laughs> that's the amazing part. Then, a week later, he wins the U.S. title from Tully. The national title. National title. Yeah. This national U.S. bullshit, as we will address, is a mess. As I have said since the first time we started watching these, too many belts on these shows. So, Cornette's out there, and he's insulting the announcers. And he looks at David Crockett and says, Is that your head, or did your neck throw up? And Crockett just laughs and says, I like him. He did. And then Cornette's <laughs> ranting and raving. And if you watch David Crockett, he's just standing there and he's gazing at Jim Cornette. <laughs> like, this man is amazing at his job. David Crockett may have had a, may have had a crush on every single TV personality associated with uh, Jim Crockett promotion. I think he was just starstruck by everybody. Exactly, yeah. His dad was the fucking promoter. And he's starstruck. Dick Murdoch versus Mike Rose. So much amazing things to discuss here. First of all, Cornette is running Murdoch down in commentary, and of course the commentary podium is just 10 or 12 feet from the ring, so Murdoch hears him, dares him to come out, everyone cheers. So Mike Rose is out there, and he's wearing an amateur wrestling singlet. And it, it, it's not just like a, uh, the pro wrestling version of it, it's like, like, like King Kong Bundy's. It looks like the guy just stepped off an amateur team. So Murdoch, Murdoch looks at him and says, all right, let's see what this guy can do. And he takes him down in like referee's position, and he waits for Mike Rose to do something, and he waits, and he waits, and he waits, and he just pushes him to the ropes and realizes, this dude don't know shit. David Crock is his brother, by the way. Yeah. Apologize. Yeah. So, there's a terrible match going on, and finally Murdoch goes to finish him off with a brain buster, and he grabs this dude, and Mike Rose completely, absolutely, totally dead weights him. So Murdoch, with all his might, lifts him maybe a foot in the air, and then drops him right on his head. Just straight This was down. amazing. He went for the brain buster, and the guy didn't go up. Yeah. And so Dick Murdoff was like, your problem, motherfucker. <laughs> Pretty much. I'm doing this move. I'm doing my finish on you. You either go up or you don't, mm -hmm. but I'm going to drop you on your head. It's going to be a lot easier if you go up. Uh, but he decided not to go up, and so he went down. The lesson, everyone, is to go up when Dick Murdoch tries to brain bust you, and I realize Dick Murdoch has passed on, but still, if you meet him in the great beyond, go up for the brain buster. So Mike Rose, like you say, his foot are about a feet off the mat. 
and Murdoch spikes him headfirst into the mat, and he spikes him so hard that Rose still goes all the way over like into a somersault. Then Murdoch pinned him. He won. Wahoo comes out with his headdress and his championship to celebrate. Mike Rose made Dick Murdoch look like Luger. And that's hard to do. Yes. What a jobber. Oh, the jobbers on this particular show. This was this was back to the beginning. I, when all we could talk about was, oh my God, you should see this jobber. I, every once in a while, will read an interview from one of the, the, the workers of this time, and they will talk about how they don't like the term jobbers. They think it's disrespectful. Listen, if you watch this show, these were jobbers. Yes. So Wahoo is out there with his headdress. He's got a new championship, and he says, this goes out to all the people who believed in me. It's their belt. It's not mine. And Jim Crockett interrupts. He says, Wahoo, congratulations on your win. But it reminded me of something. <laughs> that may not be an exact quote. He's been thinking about this for a while, but he didn't write into his own show. Yeah. He says, you know, we used to have a belt around here, a, a pair of belts, the National Tag Team Championships. And then Ole Anderson got injured, and they were not defended for 30 days, or in fact, months. So we're going to bring them back. We're going to rename them the U.S. Tag Titles for no reason. And there will be a tournament to crown new champs. I do love the national titles are now the U.S. titles. I can only assume, and I'm just thinking this... It's patriotic. Well, it's patriotic, but I think... U.S. is more patriotic than national. That, I think a a bigger deal may have been the Magnum-Nikita feud was hotter over the summer than anything Tully Blanchard did with the national title. So they went with that. I don't think so, and the only reason I say that is because look at the Great American Bash... How they were so all about America. Yeah. Everything was America. I think that's why they just wanted U.S. instead of national. It was more patriotic. It doesn't fucking matter. The Kansas Jayhawks versus Randy Barber and Alan Martin. No one trained these men how to take a backdrop. So the first time we saw this team, maybe the second Actually, time. Alan Martin was a good jobber. One, one of them was taking a backdrop. Randy Barber was yeah. horrific. Who was the one in the tan pants? Randy Barber. Like he had just left his office job, put boots on over his khakis, and hit the ring. This guy was horrific. Bald, hairy white body, skin-colored tights, I wrote. Yes. I guess you could say tan. He looked like he was naked. Well, the problem is he didn't have a tan. Well, what's funny <laughs> is this Randy Barber was absolutely just hideous, and he still had a better body than Bobby Jaggers. Yeah. So they wrestled for like an hour. The first match we saw these men in, Jim Cornette was on commentary, and he says, boy, they throw really good elbows. And after about 20 elbows later, he says, do they have anything else? Well, here we are, months later, if you watch the Kansas Jayhawks, you will still see 10 minutes of elbows. Eventually, the one with the back suplex clothesline combo. They hit the announce desk to confront Cornette and challenge the Midnight Express, and we're looking at Mantel, who Cornette called an ape, because he's hairy. He's the hairiest wrestler ever. And the first thing we notice, yes, his back and his chest are incredibly hairy, but he has shaved his arms because there's a point where his back meets his shoulders where the hair just stops at an, in a neat line. And then we look closer and realize he has also shaved his pits, which is good, but then he has shaved the sides of his torso. So his, like, the love handle area, not hairy. It was like he was wearing a fur vest. Kinda. Or a bib. A fur bib. And the funniest thing was, if you looked close, he had actually, the, the, the shaving part, the shaved part was widest at the bottom, so his chest hair was narrower at the bottom, so you know his, so his torso would look tapered, so he looked leaner than he actually was. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Can I add that in the match itself, Cornette says, there's one thing I hate. It's a team that uses a foreign object to win. Mm -hmm. David Crockett. A man of no subtlety nor comedy says, well, you must hate yourself then. <laughs> Got him there. Shivani is interviewing Murdoch in his trucker hat. I'm starting to understand why people didn't like David Crockett. <laughs> I still love him, but my God. He, he, killed, he killed a lot of jokes. <laughs> he stomped all over Cornette's joke right there. So Murdoch is putting Ric Flair over, but he says the clothes don't make the man. While Flair's running around in custom suits and limousines, I'm running around in a pickup with a hound dog. But I guarantee you, if I hit that brain buster, I'm taking that world title. Well, if Flair goes up like that other jobber, that's a fact. <laughs> Never wrestle again. And then at the end, 
Captain Redneck Dick Murdoch says of his upcoming matches with Ric Flair, it'll be a wonderful contest. <laughs> He is so nice. He's amazing. I have never because when I started, uh, when I started watching this show, it may have been eighty seven, but I think eighty eight, and he had turned by then, and he was mean, Captain Redneck. But this down home country gentleman, Captain Redneck Dick Murdoch, he is so friendly. It is amazing how back then, heels and baby faces. I mean, they were so good at their job. Yeah, he wasn't a dick when he was a baby face. No, he was a happy, charming. Southern redneck, yeah. drove a pickup truck, had a dog, did it all for the fans. Mm -hmm. Then he turns and he's diabolical. <laughs> he's just an asshole. Wahoo McDaniel versus Tony Zane. I am quite certain that if you took the Wahoo McDaniel of 1986 and put him in a time machine and brought him here to 2016, I guarantee you he would whip my ass. Oh, man, he'd kill you. He would beat the fuck out of me. That being said, my God, he looked old and fat here. Dude, he was like 49. <laughs> yes. He's 48 or 49 here. Now, that being said, he looked much better than Tony Zane. This was <laughs> there was a spot where Tony Zane just charged at Wahoo. I don't know what his plan was. And he's running at Wahoo, and Wahoo's response is to grab his neck with two hands... And then chop him. Yeah. <laughs> what I love, no. Uh, he reached both his arms out like Frankenstein and grabbed the man's neck to stop a charge. I've seen a lot of Wahoo matches, and I've always noticed, of course, he does the backhand chop, the knife edge chop, they used to call it, that Ric Flair and so many others do. And he will also do that overhand open palm strike to the chest. Tomahawk chop, they call it. That's right, that's right. There were times here, and maybe he's done these a bunch, and I have never noticed, but... He was throwing punches, but the punches landed with an open hand, so they made a loud chopping noise. But you can't fool me. They were punches. Anyway, he won with a chop. Cornette and the Minute Express did a promo. In the show that I missed, I guess, Baby Doll has now left Dusty Rhodes for Ric Flair. Yeah. And Cornette says, look, Baby Doll and I, we've had our, we've had our differences. We will never be friends. But if she's with a fine gentleman like Ric Flair, then I guess she's good enough for me. And then he vowed they would beat the Rock and Rolls and regain the tag titles. And I guess that tag title change also happened last week. Because last I heard, I thought the Midnight Express was still champions. Rock and Rolls, you missed a big show last week, and it was only 50 minutes. I guess so. Sam Houston versus Jack Weathers. <laughs> My God, Jack Weathers. This guy had a red singlet. <laughs> a red single strap singlet. Yeah, like Andre the Giant. Yeah. Blue tights mm -hmm. underneath, like ocean blue. And then Sam Houston had something on his tights. Now, to tie this in after dark tonight, I believe it was a sheep squatch that was on his tights. I bet you're wrong. Did you see it? No. You didn't I, see what I, was on his tights? I was watching the match. I didn't I notice. swear to God, it looked like a Sasquatch. It wasn't Texas. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. Could <laughs> someone don't. explain to me what was on his tights? I would be very surprised. That's the it... only thing I cared about in this match. I would be very surprised if it was a sheep squatch. <laughs> you know, I, I would, I'll would. i give you that. <laughs> it was not a sheep squatch. <laughs> but it may have been a Bigfoot. I will admit that this conversation is more entertaining than the match. Sam Houston did arm drags. He did arm ringers. He did knees to the arm. And he did a bulldog in one. Cornette interviewed Buddy Landell... And Bill Dundee. <laughs> I love that the first thing Dundee did here on Jim Crockett Promotions NWA Championship Wrestling on WTBS out of Georgia. The first thing he did was to congratulate Sam Houston on his win over Jerry the King Lawler in Memphis. Yep. Character consistency across promotions. I love that there were at least two instances on this show where I saw something and I thought something and then something became of it. All right. This would be, I'm watching Buddy Landell. Bill basically challenges Dick Murdoch, Captain Redneck. Redneck's going to feud with Flair. And so Dundee says, if you want to take on the real nature boy, take on Buddy Landell. And I thought back to what you said about how Buddy Landell's his fake nature boy, and the real nature boy never acknowledges him. This was the show where it finally happened. It finally did. So they called out Murdoch and Dusty and Magnum and the rock and rolls. And Landell is ranting, and they cut to a hot blonde in the crowd who's just sitting there for no reason. And then they cut back to the wrestlers, and they challenged Ric Flair, and that was that. Not only was she sitting there for no reason, she was bored out of her mind. <laughs> yes. That was the key. That was the key. What's she doing there? She clearly didn't care. I don't know. Or maybe she just didn't like the heels. 
Rock and Roll Express versus Phil Brown and Lee Peak. Lee Peak was good this week. He's a decent jobber, decent physique, good worker. Ricky Morton came out, kissed a 10-year-old while making his entrance, and they worked over Lee Peak's leg for three minutes and one with a double drop kick. Ric Flair and Baby Doll came out for a promo, and the first thing Ric Flair did was to plug their upcoming appearance at a fishing tournament. Seriously. He runs down Dick Murdoch, and then, wonder of wonders, he does finally address Buddy Landell. Now, you and I were watching this together. We were watching this on your iPad. So maybe uh, the sound was very good, actually, but I, I am not certain what Buddy Landell said. Maybe you can help me out. Or so Flair what, said what, about Buddy. What, what Flair said about Buddy Landell. He explains, Ric Flair says this, that he got the nickname Space Mountain because one night a woman was with him and screamed out, it's like riding Space Mountain. But the girls who were with Landell, they called him Ride the Wild Mouth. Is that what he said? I thought he said ride the wild mountain. Mountain. Ride but that doesn't make any mountain. sense either. It doesn't start me None of this makes any sense. So, yeah, I have no idea what Maybe there was a really, was really about. bad ride in 1986 called Wild Mountain. I guess. Like a, like a, like, is there there's like a, Space Mountain. Yeah. And so maybe like at Six Flags, they had the Wild Mountain, right. which was their version of the Splash Mountain or the, the Space, Space Mountain. Mountain it wasn't but it very sucked. good. Yeah. That makes more sense. That's the than, only thing that I can figure. That makes more sense than ride the wild mouth. So he runs down Dusty, Wahoo, Garvin, and everyone else, and he dares them all to come take his belt and take his woman. Buddy Landell and Bill Dundee versus Rocky King and Burton Deaton. Literally nothing to say about this match. King ran wild for several minutes, and the heels beat up Deaton, and Dundee won with a top rope sit-down splash. <laughs> One of the most mystifying 15-second segments I ever saw. Dude, I liked it. Shivani brings in Craig Sager of TBS Sports. And baseball Hall of Famer Warren Spawn. They talked for 15 seconds, they plugged nothing, and that was it. Dude, let's say that you and I are doing the Brian and Vinny show, and for some reason, Babe Ruth walks into our house. Well, this would be news. It would be. Now, will you not encourage me to call Babe Ruth up to the studio and just say hi to everybody? I guess so, It's yeah. a big fucking deal that Babe Ruth is in my house. Sure. For a lot of reasons. Yeah. So, hey, these numbskulls weren't guest hosts. No. A Hall of Famer was there watching wrestling. Okay. Who, by the way, put over wrestling? Yes, he did. He said, thank God I went to baseball. I saw that brain buster. Fuck that. So they were like, hey, just say hi to everybody. It was 15 seconds long. They told the world that a baseball Hall of Famer was a wrestling fan, and they were out of there. How great would it have been if Warren Spahn had said, fuck that on TBS? <laughs> he should have. Yeah. Cornette interviews the Russians, including Nikita and the new U.S. title, or his new U.S. title. I thought this was awesome. And they vowed, you know, wouldn't it be great, they said, now that we have the U.S. singles championship, and we could have the U.S. tag titles at the same time. And they accused Magnum T.A. of lying about who Nikita's opponent in Atlanta would be, but it didn't matter. Nikita would beat anyone. That's right. They said that Magnum claimed that Nikita's opponent was going to be Ronnie Garvin. And he was lying. And it was made very clear that a man should always know his opponent. So Magnum was trying to get an advantage by lying about the opponent. That's right. So they're running their mouths, and out comes Shivani. He interrupts and says, uh, I have a video to show you. It's Nikita's first meeting with Ronnie Garvin. And Nikita slams the belt down on the podium in anger. And Ivan is screaming, I told you not to show this. And they go to the tape. And it's Nikita fighting Sam Houston. And he wins clean with a sickle. But then he <laughs> just killed him. But then he grabs his chain. He's going to murder this man. And out comes Ronnie Garvin to make the save. And he's up against the unstoppable Russian, and he drops him with a knockout punch. It's even better. Ronnie Garvin gets in the ring, and Nikita goes to clothesline Ron Garvin with the chain. Mm -hmm. And Ron just punches right over the chain and <laughs> knocks him out. <laughs> Didn't even duck. No. This, uh, fuck you and your chain. I'm punching you in the mouth. Place went crazy. Yes. So they go back to the studio. Ivan is screaming, A, that was a sucker punch, which is actually even funnier with your detailed description. <laughs> and B, this is wrestling. Punching is not allowed. He's right. And Nikita says, listen, he knocked me down. I'll admit that, but I have not been knocked out. And Ronnie Garvin, I dare you to meet me face to face. What a baby face. Jimmy Garvin versus Rocky Cronodal in a match that may have gone three hours. Jimmy Garvin had to just like Rocky Cronodal, right? I guess. <laughs> this went forever, and he gave him all sorts of stuff. Th this was... I don't think there was any cheating in this match, and almost all grappling. There was more 
it was not as good, but there was more scientific wrestling in this match than almost anything Kurt Angle ever did. Dude, there was more cheating with Jimmy Garvin later than with this Garvin. Jimmy Garvin. Ronnie. Ronnie. Yeah. No, Jimmy. So the, my, my real curiosity about this match is, A, are there that many fans who wanted to sit down on a Saturday afternoon and watch two men fight over head scissors for so many minutes? And two, Garvin had random waxed patches on his chest, and I am dying to know the rib that caused those. Jimmy Valiant cheated more than Jimmy, Jimmy Garvin. Valiant. That's what I'm trying to say. I see, yes. So the announcers were ogling Precious and then chiding each other for ogling Precious. The fans were chanting Precious shopped at Kmart. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Even in 1986, Man. that was an insult. And Garvin finally... After a bunch of head scissors and arm drags, eventually hit like two elbows and the brain buster and one. And it was a better brain buster than Murdoch's this week. But it was still fucked up. It was still fucked up. Dude, the reason that this guy retired at 40 and lives on a fucking ranch is because they shopped at Kmart when he was making his money. Amen. Amen. So Cornette interviews Garvin. And Garvin calls out Magnum TA. says, first of all, Magnum got to start as a male dancer in San Francisco. Second of all, anyone with Magnum as a first name and T.A. as a second name can't be that tough. Says, so I'm out here. I don't need the world's finest suits. I don't need a big shiny belt. All I need is the world's hottest squeeze. <laughs> Not a baby face. And nobody's man enough to come out here and shut me up. And I'm going to take Magnum down about 20 notches. Precious was, he goes, he says, I have the most beautiful woman in the world. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as the women on this show go, no offense to anybody, he was definitely right. Yes, Precious was very beautiful. If they would have, if they would have, if they would, if they made her up like they make up the girls today, she would have fit right in on Raw. Absolutely. But that perm, that's gotta hey, go. How dare you? That perm has got to go. It was the 1980s, dude. It doesn't matter. She had straight hair for like a year. She looked great. I'll be honest. She, she was, came out looking like Mula one day. She was out here this week in a, I guess you call it a blouse, but it was gold glitter in the front and, and bare skin in the back. And I was that's all I could focus on. Yeah, she's hot. She's very hot. Shivani interviewed Magnum and Dusty. <laughs> Two dudes. He should have been at a bar trading shots of whiskey. They're out there in their jean jackets. They're both wearing sunglasses inside. Magnum just lost his belt. Dusty's lost, just lost his belt and his woman. Magnum's forehead is all scarred up. Like at any moment, blood may just pour out of his head. He says, Jimmy Garvin's got me all wrong. I'm not a fancy guy at all. And you can ask plenty of guys around here that tell you I'm the toughest man they've ever fought. And Dusty begins to speak. And he just makes some observations. He says, so if I look around here, I see Ric Flair's got a woman. Jimmy Garvin's got a very loose woman, he notes. Oh, come on. Magnum's got his choice of 30 women a night, and I'm doing just fine taking his leftovers. And that's not what he said word for word, but it's very close. He said Magnum could have 30 ladies a night, and I'd just pick up the slack. Pick up the slack, that's what he said. He says this entire station was built on Dusty Rhodes versus Ole Anderson. Now it's the same thing all these years later, just with the horseman Magnum and Dick Murdoch thrown in. And he insulted Flair's chubby girlfriend in the front row when he left. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you watch the stuff that's better than the stuff today, like the promos, it feels very modern. Like the Dusty Rhodes character, the Magnum character, the promos. It feels, it, 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 it's like, it's as good as what you'd see today and better in a lot of ways. It feels modern. Then Dusty mentions the TBS launched nine years ago. <laughs> Yeah. It was actually 10 years earlier, 1976. This is a long fucking time ago. Yeah, these, these, well, yeah. The first station to go up on satellite was nine years before he did this promo. Yes. I can barely even believe it. Jimmy Valiant versus Art Pritz. Valiant is still out there with his do rag. He almost lost it at one point. Did you notice that? Oh, yeah. He put it back on he, quick. He was adjusting and making sure it was extra tight. And he. Here's all I wrote. They did every Boogie Woogie match ever. That's because... I didn't even write down the finish. We weren't even watching the match. We were watching my baby watch the match. That's true. Paisley watched this match intently. She loves the Boogie Woogie man. They're very into Boogie. And then Whitney says, is that beard real? Yeah. And you said yes. Absolutely. And her response, I swear to God, was, that's a really nice beard. Yes. Look how full and fluffy it is. It is full and fluffy and clean. 
That was not what I was expecting when this match started. <laughs> and the other thing that occurred to me is uh, playing with Paisley. Uh, she likes my beard. Yeah. She likes to scratch the rubber hand over my beard. It's very you know, confusing to her, of course. Imagine what she'd do with Boogie Woogie's beard. Oh, beard. man. She'd be trying to eat it. Yeah. Cornette interviews Dylan and Blanchard. So JJ starts, and he's trying to put on a brave face. He says, I know everyone's coming out here expecting me to be all down in the dumps because Tully Blanchard has lost the national championship, but I feel great. And I feel great because Tully is the greatest national champion of all time. And I feel great because I know he's going to get that title back. And I feel great because everywhere we go, the fans don't point at Tully and say, there's the man who lost the national title. The fans point at Tully and say, that's the man who beat up Dusty Rhodes so bad he lost the world title. And it's Tully's turn to speak. And he cannot pretend to be as enthusiastic as JJ. He explains the championships in pro wrestling are big bucks. The national championship was big bucks. Dusty's world championship was big bucks. And he transitions this to, in the end, he is the man who cost Dusty Rhodes the world title. So he's going to focus more on hating Dusty Rhodes than losing the national championship. Hell of a promo, as always. As always. Cornette interviewed the Andersons. And he, of course, wanted a title match against the Rock and Rolls. Oli also, cut out, Oli also called out Dusty and Magnum and Tulsa Tubby, which I assume was Wahoo. Arn, yeah, I guess. And Arn said, I have been focused so much on Dusty Rhodes lately that I have forgotten about my bread and butter this TV championship. And he admitted that Tully's loss had sharpened his, champion, his own championship into focus. And he'd been out around the country every week facing the top competition, and every week he walked out and he was still champion. And now that he was focused again... He's back on his guard, and no man was going to beat him in 20 minutes for this belt. Andersons versus Italian Stallion and Henry Rutley. <laughs> Here is everything I wrote about the match. So Rutley tagged in, and the Andersons killed him in one with an armbar. So they gave a ton to the Italian Stallion. So much that Cornette was wondering what he'd eaten in his Wheaties or something yes, like that this yes. morning. So Italian Stallion's running wild. He's got him on the ropes, beating him, bouncing him all over. And then they got their hands on Henry Rutley. That was all she wrote. The end. Henry Rutley. Yeah. Pretty sure this guy's new. A new terrible jobber for us <laughs> to ridicule on a weekly basis. Shivani interviewed the Road Warriors. First of all, they noted that when they showed up, Cornette suddenly left. So it hit me watching this. Just how much Steve Austin took his interview style from Road Warrior Hawk. He's t Hawk is telling the story... About how he and his brother had some days off. They weren't happy to have some days off. They weren't happy to not be fighting. And I don't even know where a story went because it occurred to me, if you put this exact same promo word for word with a Texas accent, that's Stone Cold Steve Austin right there. An animal ran his mouth. They were doing the Minneapolis tour, going back to the old stomping grounds, and they dared anyone to come fight them. Tony said the Warriors, winners of the Jim Crockett Senior Memorial Cup, $1,000. Then he pauses and goes, I'm sorry, a million dollars. He was off. <laughs> it was like, that's quite the uh, discrepancy right there, Tony. He was off by, I believe, 10,000%. I could be wrong on that. So it's time for the Schick Match of the Week. Oh, man, this was so much better than last week's Schick Match of the Week. I don't know what it was last week, but I know the week before, the Schick Match of the Week also sucked. So it's Ric Flair versus Mike Jackson. This match was awesome. And Ric Flair decided, you know what? I'm going to have a three-plus star match with Mike Jackson today. Yeah. And he did. Boy, did he ever. This <laughs> Mike Jackson. First off, sometimes Flair carries a broomstick. Mm -hmm. Mike Jackson was good. Yeah, yeah. Not only was Mike Jackson good, mm -hmm. but Flair and Steamboat used to have these matches where they would go in and they would try to blow the other up. Right. Swear to God. That had to be what they were doing here. May have been. They were just going, 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 going. And you know they called the whole thing in the ring. Of course. Tons of tackle drop down spots just over and over and they over said, again. Running as fast as they can. Mm. Neither guy would blow up. Oh, Neither no. guy would quit. No. This match was awesome. Yeah, they were saying Mike Jackson was a nationally ranked junior heavyweight. Which, once top five. Once top five, they said. May still be. And it was just, you know, I've seen Ric Flair do this a hundred times. He did it a million times. But he took a guy who the fans thought, going in, this man has no chance of Ric Flair, and he convinced them, this man may get a win against the world heavyweight champion right before my very eyes. And it occurred to me here, 
we always talk about, boy, I'd love to have a match with that guy. And obviously it's not a revelation. Boy, I'd like to have a match with Ric Flair. I mean, duh. But I'm pretty sure if you ask anyone who's ever wrestled a match, if you could have one match against one one wrestler in their prime, who would it be? It has to be Ric Flair. Has to be. There's no one close. No. So they're having this great match, and Mike Jackson is looking like a million bucks, and Flair's doing everything he can to make him like a star. Dude, not even not in his prime. Well, I'd sure. had a match with Ric Flair in, in 2009. That, it would have been great. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. So Mike Jackson puts Ric Flair in the figure four leg lock. The fans are jumping up and down. And the trade blows mid-ring. Jackson gets the better of it. But finally, Flair ducks a crossbody. Jackson hits the ropes and, you know, flies into the ropes and bounces back into the mat. He has made his ultimate mistake. And Flair hits one elbow and the figure four, and he gets the win. Just Ric Flair carrying Mike Jackson to a great match on a random Saturday afternoon just because he wanted to. <laughs> he was the best. He was the this best. This is why he was the best. Yes. This is what he did better than anyone else was take a guy with no chance and make you believe for 50 minutes everyone watching this around the country believed Mike Jackson is on par with Ric Flair. Well, my point is there's a lot of guys who if you're in the ring with someone good, you're going to go in and have a good match. Mm -hmm. If you're in the ring with someone that sucks, you're just going to like squash them or you're just going to do the bare minimum or you're going to idiot proof the match or whatever. Flair would go in with fucking everybody and he would do everything he could to have a great match. Yes. Every night he did that and every night he got better at his craft. And he was so good at getting a great match out of a total geek that when the time came to wrestle somebody that had a clue, he'd have a ten times better match. Yes. God, Flair was great. Yeah. The best of all time. Breaking news, everyone. In 2016, Ric Flair was a great wrestler. Nikita Koloff versus Dave Spencer. Koloff immediately hit two sickles and one, sitting on Spencer like Ronnie Garvin pinned his guys. Paul Jones and the Army cut a promo. <laughs> you know what's funny about this? A lot Everything. Of First off, as soon as it starts, I'm like, when the fuck was the last time we saw T. Joe Khan wrestle? Far too long. Well, since we saw T. Joe Khan, whether he's wrestling or not, I just want to see T. Joe Khan on TV. I regretted it five minutes later, <laughs> having said that. The other thing was, Shaska's out there, and he's wearing a hat with a feather. Just like Andrade Cien Almas. Yeah. For as smart as Triple H is, give me a fucking break. Shaska's better. The point is, Shaska's a fucking heel wearing that outfit. Yeah, that too. You thought that Andre Andrade C. at Almas, you're going to put him in fucking suspenders and a top hat with a fucking feather, and he was going to get over as a baby face? He got over as a shithead. And now, by the way, at the latest NXT tapings, they got rid of it. Because apparently it took them six months to figure out this fucking guy ain't getting over with suspenders and a feather in his hat, like Yankee Doodle. So no ball bearing this week. That made me sad. Especially when the match started. Oh, that's a, that's a good point. So otherwise, the whole crew is there. They explain that to train for their match with Jimmy Valiant, they are going on a tour through the central United States. They vow to leave every opponent as a bald-headed geek. And Shaska says, we've been whipping Valiant on the West Coast. We've been whipping Valiant on the East Coast. Soon we'll be whipping him in the central states. And he's going on and on. And it's, 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 <laughs> it's Shaska on the left-hand side of the screen. And Paul Jones in the middle looking sternly at Shaska. And then on the right is T. Joe Khan. And his eyes are bugging out, and he is flexing, and he snaps his head to the right. He snaps his head to the left. He snaps his head straight up, straight down, straight at the camera, straight to the right again. He looked like a bird. He was a seagull. Yeah. That's when J.J. Dillon wrote his book, Wrestlers Are Like Seagulls. He was talking about T. Joe Khan. Clearly. So we had Shaska Watley, Baron Von Raschke, and Tijo Khan versus an amazing collection of geeks. Oh, my God. Mark Cooper, Charles Freeman, and the most amazing of them all, Johnny Cook. Johnny Cook is out there looking for all the world like a flabby Zack Sabre Jr. Cornette is begging this man to get in the ring. Oh, man. Cornette built this Cornette up. Cornette knew what was going on. He knew that when this guy tagged in... Entertainment <laughs> would occur. Nothing boring would happen. They kept him on the apron as long as they could. They had wanted no part of Johnny Cook. Finally, they tagged him in. Now, I've only seen Johnny Cook wrestle for eight seconds, would you say? Yeah. 
In those eight seconds, is it fair to say he's the worst wrestler you ever saw on national oh my God. TV? He's the worst wrestler of all time. <laughs> now, think about this, by the way. This was no mystery because Cornette was begging for them to tag the guy in. Yeah. Okay. So if you know this guy so fucking horrible, they had to have designed it on purpose to put him in with T. Joe Khan. Sure. They did not put him in with the Baron. No. They didn't put him in with Shaska. No. They put him in with fucking T. Joe Khan. Now, to be fair, they had one spot. T. Joe was going to drag him into the ring, which he fucked up and fell down. <laughs> T. Joe was going to give him a strike, which he fucked up and he fell down. And then Tijo was going to throw him into the ropes and give him a body slam. I don't even think he was trying to do a power slam. I don't know. I think he was just going to lift him up and body slam him. This fucking guy could not even anything, cl- like everyone listening to this right now, could go up easier for a body slam. I guarantee you. This guy made his body completely rigid. Yes. And he tried to go down, not up. He was fighting for his life to stay down. I just compared him to the skinniest guy on the roster. He was the skinniest guy in the 1986 roster in Jim Crockett Promotions. And T.J. Khan, Lord knows, not a great wrestler, but a big, strong, jacked-up dude. And Mark Cook, Johnny Cook, pardon me, that's probably a Mark Cook somewhere I just insulted. Johnny Cook, although come to think of it, maybe calling him Mark was a uh, subconscious thing there. Johnny Cook comes off the ropes, and this tiny little wisp of a man... T. Joe Can is fighting all he can to get him up at first slam. And finally he says, fuck this. And he hurts him up and he slams him down. Probably legit holds him down and pins him. He's got to be the worst. <laughs> you must and all you know see what? this. Let it's me tell you why he's... seconds, everyone. Go watch the end of this match. I'm going to tell you one more reason why he's the worst. Maybe he was a cameraman. Maybe he was just they needed a body and they got a janitor. Okay. If that were the case, I could at least say, this guy's not a trained wrestler. But when T. Show Khan was fighting the battle of a lifetime to get this motherfucker up in the air, when he finally started turning him upside down, Johnny Cook actually posted on his leg. <laughs> now, he didn't do it right. He wasn't actually pushing, but he put his hand where it's supposed to go when you're helping a guy with a body slam. Sure. That is proof to me that this guy had been trained... Which means he is without question the worst wrestler of all time. So Murdoch comes out for one last promo. And he's calling out Ric Flair again. He starts insulting Baby Doll. Says, if she bent over in my farm, I couldn't tell her apart from any of my horses. Wow. (laughs) This, of course, brings out Ric Flair and Baby Doll and all the horsemen. You ever heard of Cuckoo Clock? I have heard of Cuckoo Clock. Last week, I believe it was Dusty was doing a promo on Baby Doll. And I don't know what he said. But they bleeped it out with the cuckoo clock. <laughs> That's awesome. Something about riding her like a horse or something. Wow. But it was it was too much for TBS, and they cuckoo clocked him out. <laughs> that horrible whistle. Anyway, the horsemen are out there yelling at Murdoch. He's yelling back at them. And the key is, they're looking at him, so their backs are to the ring. And he says, look, I'll fight any one of you one-on-one, but it's for you and one of me. This is this. I'm not going to do this, but any one of you has got the balls to fight me, I'll fight you. And... I think there was a lot of shouting going on, but eventually they took him up on his challenge. So they back up to the ring, and then they turn around and get into the ring, and there they see Magnum TA, Dusty Rhodes, and Ronnie Garvin waiting for them. And a great eight-way brawl breaks out, and the place is going nuts, and the baby faces are in the process of clearing the ring. When Tony says, we gotta go! And David Crockett says, no, no, no! And they went. Now we go off the air, and David Crockett's still screaming, look at him go! Rides and laughs everywhere! And then they go off the air. That ruled. These shows were awesome. Dude, this show was great. <laughs> yeah. There have been shows that sucked. This was not one of them. This was amazing. All right, everybody.